of the information, all of the content, all of the conversations and transfer that into action to create some commercial results. That's my intention. Now research shows that when we can actually record and write down our learning intention for the conference, we can increase our learning transfer. So I'm sure we've all got some pens and paper. Um, damn it, I'm going to get you to do something. And what I want you to do is to grab out a pen and write down, just quickly, 20 seconds or so, what's your intention for the next two days? What do you want to walk away with at the end of Friday afternoon? Maybe just walk away with a hangover. Maybe it's walk home with some other partner. I don't know what it is, but hopefully it's a bit better than that. Just quickly write down what is your intention for the next two days. Beautiful. And if you're not sure, you can always have a bit of a sneaky peek at the person next to you, see what they've got going down. Excellent, okay, now now that you've got that written down, I want you to look at the person next to you, look at the person next to you, yes, and look at them deep in the eyes and say, you are my BFF, you are my best friend forever, and I want you to share with them, you are my BFF, what goes on tour stays on tour, I want you to share with them what's your intention, because research shows when we interact, we will increase our transfer, what do you want to share, quick, quick, quick share, 60 seconds with the partner next to you, have a chat. seconds. Five, four, three, two, and one. Winding it up there. No, little we'll fingers in the air. See how we go. Yep. Little fingers we'll in the air, best. please. Little fingers in the air. Little fingers in the air. Beautiful. Who would like a cup of tea? Excellent. Turn that into a fist and fist bump the person next to you. Don't punch them. Fist bump. Cool. We can do this. Excellent. All right. Um, a couple of interesting things that I've found that when we come to events like this, there are three things that often get in the way of our learning. And it's not just middle-aged men that experience this. Um, the first one is what we call premature evacuation. And uh, what that means is when we're often on the edge of a learning precipice, we're just about to get a big insight, we drift off and we go, I wonder what I'm going to do on the weekend. Ah, what I'm going to do next week. And we lose that moment, that epiphany when we're just about to get a big idea. So be mindful of that. The second one that can happen, not again just for middle-aged men, is premature relocation. And that is when we have the idea, we go, oh, that's a very good idea. And we think, you know what, this would be really good for, for Lisa, my sister, who's working over in Perth City Council. And we start to project it onto other people rather than think we should be applying this to what we do today. And the third one is what we call premature evaluation. Now, that's when we sort of cross the arms and go, mate, I've heard of this before. Tell us something new. And the reality is quite often we probably actually are going to learn something new. And if we're not open to those sort of ideas, those insights, then we're likely to, to lose out from making the most of this event. Is that all clear? We're we okay with being open to those three things? Beautiful. Now the next thing that I just want to take you through is a little bit of housekeeping. Um, you might have noticed that we all have lanyards and this is really important that we bring them to every function that we go to, whether it's tonight to the breakout things. One, because there's a blue card in there for people with dietary things. We don't want to serve you something and have to deal with an anaphylactic shock. Um, at the same time we want to make sure that our door bitch doesn't stop you from getting in, which might be me. I don't want to be the bouncer that stops you from coming in. So make sure you wear those things out there. Now, in case of an emergency, which is very, very unlikely, unless we have spontaneous combustion from the excitement and all the ideas, we will hear a whoop, whoop, whoop. Now, we don't party up, but we just wait calmly until we hear announcement over the AV as the, the um, staff check out whether it's a real alarm or a false alarm. And if it's a real alarm, the alarm will start up again. If that's the case, we'll follow through the exits, down through the, the two main little stairways down there, out through the front foyer and muster out into the Port Cashier area in the car park. There is also another stairwell out in the kitchenette which is out the back there. So we're all cool, emergency happens, that's what we do. All right, 
Now, my job, apart from being the master of chaos or the master of change and master of ceremonies, is to help you with your energy. And I really believe that everyone here is the CEO. You are your own chief energy officer. What that means, if you find your energy departing, do something about it. You know, it's okay to step up and walk to the side or have a drink of water, but manage your energy so that you can get the most out of the things here. We've got some amazing people in the room. As I mentioned, the genius is already here. And you may have noticed there's a couple of graffiti boards that are around with some questions and I was having a chat with a couple of people down in in the um, the, okay. the expo area out the front there I was having a chat with Gary and Bob from from Tinterfield who were telling us about what's one of the big obstacles to getting visitors coming to you it was around marketing costs um, I was having a, a chat to to Patrick and Annie from Broken Hill who was saying one of the big obstacles for them is around flight costs I was talking to Sam from Newcastle saying one of the big obstacles there is around having too many attractions and not one singular attraction Attraction. There are ideas that we can all share. Um, one of the posters outside, someone had written down, actually it was Craig, one of our keynote speakers, and it was the question was, how can we get, um, what idea can we adapt to apply to get more visitors? And his suggestion was to invite the Drogue Racing League, International Drogue, sorry not Drogue, um, Drone Racing League to come and run an event at your local community. Why? Because they televise it on ESPN for free. Um, amazing different things. So please, when you have your breaks, I know you've come with your buddies, but step out of your comfort zone. Meet someone new. Ask them the question, what are you doing in your council? What in your area? And that's the best way that we can learn. We all good? All right, so turn to the person next to you. Put your hand on the shoulder. Give them a shake. Wake up. It's time to learn. <laughs> yes. Damn it, he's interactive. Um, a couple of thanks I want to give before we get started. Um, big thanks to Arts Mid North Coast no, for the no, pre-conference no, no. drinks Sorry, and snacks. Anyone? I know I heard oh, a lot of raucous voices as they started a party on later on. Thank you so much for them. And um, also, what we've got coming up after our first speaker today, I'm not a speaker, I'm just a show pony. Um, we've actually got the awesome um, Narigan Miram Women's Choir going to be doing an awesome performance. Um, and you might have seen Auntie Rhonda do a beautiful welcome to country, and there's going to be more of that happening there today. Okay, one last thing, just to get our energy going before I call up our first speaker, is you know, we can come to events like this and we're a little bit ah yeah okay let's do something um who's ever been to a golf tournament and actually been in an audience a few weirdos out there a couple yeah yeah and so what kind of clapping do you get at a golf tournament just give us a let's do the little golf clap oh yes let's all try that now because let's interact oh yes Okay. So that's not really going to be that exciting, is it? That's going to be a little bit lame. Now I'm actually really happy about what someone's shared with you. Give us that kind of clap. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now I want you to think of, um, it's, it's a, a grandchild or a child or a, a loved member at a Christmas pageant doing a performance. Give them that kind of applause. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. And one last one, I want you to think, you've got your favourite musician, artist, I don't know who it is, Madonna, if she's still alive, uh, ACDC, if they're not in jail, um, just your favourite band, whatever it is, give us a raucous sound for that as well. Yes! All right. Okay. All right, so with that, that cheer in mind, I want to introduce you our first speaker today. And our first speaker is Councillor Jerome Laxale. He's the Mayor of Ryde, um, the top of the city as I often say for those that are out there. And Jerome has served as the Treasurer of the LGNSW since October 2019. We love people that volunteer. And after running a family business for a decade, which for him has felt like a lifetime, he was elected as um, in City of Ryde in 2012. And by the end of this current term, he'll have served as the Mayor for five years. So He's obviously doing a great job. He currently serves on the boards of the state cover um, mutual and local government procurement and he's also previously served as vice president of the Metropolitan Regional Organization of Councils. So let's make some noise and let's go straight to the Christmas pageant kind of volume for Councillor Jerome. Come on in, Mr. <laughs> Councillor. Beautiful. Excellent. All right, that's a tough act to follow. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, I would like to, of course, start by acknowledging the Beer Pie people as traditional owners of these lands on which uh, this conference is held and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. For those who don't know me, my name's Jerome Laxell. I'm here representing the fabulous Local Government New South Wales President, Councillor Linda Scott, in my capacity as Treasurer of the Local Government New South Wales Board. Uh, I'm currently serving as Mayor of the City of Ryde and I hope this morning I can give you a brief showcase of the work 
local government New South Wales is doing for you, our members. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard a Treasurer deliver a keynote speech like this. It will in no way be as entertaining as what Neil's just did, so uh, we'll just get through it and we'll get through some acknowledgements and welcomes as well. So thank you to all the elected representatives and a special mention to them, mayors, councillors and ministers. And of course, uh, the Honourable Stuart Ayres MP, Minister for Jobs, yeah. Investment, Tourism and Western Sydney. Uh, Jenny Aitchison MP, Shadow Minister for Investment, Tourism, Medical Research and Primary Industry. And the Honourable yeah. Leslie Williams MP, the member for Port Macquarie. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the amazing local government New South Wales team who have put on today, uh, led by experienced CEO uh, Scott Phillips. And thank you to all of you uh, for showing your support for the important work council officers do in tourism, economic development and visitor services. Uh, this 2021 theme reflects the new branding of our conference. The theme is creating destinations for living, learning, visiting and investing. The theme reflects the role of councils in the broader visitor economy, which is comprised of conditions that create appealing communities and local economies, and tourists, of course, are just part of this. Special mention needs to go to Port Macquarie Hastings Council and Mayor Peter Pinson for dri diving in to host the first edition of this newly rebranded conference. And it's no surprise that we have a number of quality organisations that have agreed to sponsor mm -hmm. this conference. And as Treasurer of Local Government New yeah. South Wales, I would particularly yeah. like to thank them for sponsoring this conference. Uh, and yeah, as a return favour, I will say, seats. please well, go and visit on. all their trade exhibition stands and maybe buy something. Then they will return and be a conference uh, a sponsor at the next conference, which would be fantastic. Um, look, you don't need me to tell you, but what you've all gone through in the past 18 months has been extremely challenging. And your response to those challenges uh, has been nothing short of exceptional. You've done your councils, your communities and your organisations proud. Your creativity and resilience in support of the visitor economy will remain vital to a locally led economic recovery and new jobs creation uh, for our state. Uh, from Blaney Shire Council, which has a tour tourism events grant open for the next month or so, so that local businesses can host uh, visitor attracting events, uh, to the economic development team in Meineke Woods in the city of Ryde that has led campaigns to encourage locals to shop and dine locally using our Love Eastwood, Love Gladesville and Love Macquarie Park town centre activation campaigns. It's such a critical time for local government with councils across New South Wales working hard to drive a locally led recovery uh, for the economic impacts of COVID-19. For this reason, Local Government New South Wales has launched an advocacy campaign last month to lobby the state and federal governments for further economic stimulus to councils in recognition that local government is best placed to drive job creation and locally led recovery from economic recession. The focus of state and federal governments currently is job creation and we want to show them rightfully that by investing in local government that they will invest in communities in all corners of New South Wales. For some of you, um, this conference might be your main touch point with local government New South Wales. So I wanted to take the opportunity to showcase some of the other initiatives our association has been working on for our member councils. Uh, just in last month, new short term rental rules were put on hold to the end of the year following local government New South Wales advocacy. Uh, this will give the government time to undertake more consultation with affected councils. And a few weeks ago, we also made comment on behalf of councils to the proposed agritourism planning changes, reiterating that councils should retain the ability to make planning decisions that best suit their local communities. Sometimes one size fits all. Uh, doesn't cut it. Uh, although I'm fairly new at Local Government New South Wales, I'm looking forward to building on the organisation's work to date, whether that be through advocacy or through our other services to councils, including workplace relations, legal advice, recruitment, training and of course professional networking. With that, I'd like to share a brief video which was created for councillors to explore the many aspects of what Local Government New South Wales does for our members. Almost worked. Here we go. Local Government New South Wales is the best. It stands up for councils across New South Wales and their communities. From Broken Hill 
to Byron Bay, from Burwood to Blaney. We're here to support our member councils as they support their communities. As a member of Local Government New South Wales, our members can access a range of expertise via our policy advisors that cover issues including environment, planning, finance and legal. These uh, programs offer capacity building, funding and resources to councils that might otherwise not be available. We have a team of professionals and industrial lawyers who provide a range of core and fee services to members in the areas of recruitment, performance management, industrial relations and local government related legislation and regulations. And that's led to a whole range of huge wins um, from state and federal government that have benefited councils directly and those local communities. We have a really democratic process where councils bring their motions to our conference, determine our policies and then help us get our priorities for the year. And we advocate on behalf of councils to seek the changes that they need from other levels of government. Some of the most unknown parts of local government New South Wales is the training that we do. We have members across the state who don't always have the opportunity to meet with each other as frequently as they would like. We understand that sometimes that can be quite isolating. We are able to provide that mentoring service so that our members can turn to somebody who will be able to share some advice and be able to assist with all of the challenges that we know exist there whether it's understanding budgets, using social media, uh, or any of the other training that Local Government New South Wales offers, all of it is a great investment in your ability to be the best elected mayor or councillor that you can be. Council should be a member of Local Government New South Wales because it's a great investment in supporting every local government. We've been brought into the fold and it's great to be able to pick up the phone and actually talk to someone that we know that listens. But more importantly, it's great to be associated with an organisation that if they don't know, they ring us and ask. It's great, it's the way it should be. And that's, that's a mutual respect. We are so grateful that we have a strong association that truly care about the issues that matter to us. There's a lot of noise in the atmosphere about there. There's a lot of people asking government for a lot of things. By coming together as that united voice, we're maximising our opportunities to ensure that we can deliver value to the communities we serve. We want to make sure the value proposition to join Local Government New South Wales is very clear so that you're confident every dollar you spend will pay you and your community back more than that dollar invested. Please, I encourage you to get involved with all that Local Government New South Wales has to offer. Um, that video there was filmed in uh, our newly renovated offices in Margaret Street and particularly in the Members Lounge. So if ever you're in Sydney, you can make a booking for that lounge as a meeting room uh, to do some work in between meetings or whatever. So please take use of that service and all the other services we've got to offer. And with that, I close my speech. Uh, it's now my honour to welcome the Narragan Mirren Choir in recognition of Reconciliation Week. And as they get ready, I would ask us please to have a few moments silence to acknowledge the hurt and the process of healing that is still ongoing for the traditional owners of this land. Thank you. This is my grandfather's country. Always was and always will be beautiful country. Let us all go together as one. Thank you. In acknowledging Birupai Barai, I pay respect and honour Naya Barai, Mother Earth, the land and all she holds.
landforms, waterways, creatures, all plants, ancestors, elders, all peoples, and you here today. I offer a blessing to cleanse and protect and bring good spirit. I like to introduce Nada Gummiri, the Morning Star Choir, a uh, choir that's grown from uh, Jigan Dambam, the Strong System movement. And today, the choir is singing Billy in Maryland, the river is flowing. And this song is sung all around the world in different indigenous languages. And today, we'll be singing it in the language of this language. The song is about honouring our waterways and our strong connection to Mother Earth. actually all sing together. So I think we've pretty, done pretty well. <laughs> and these girls are styling the most beautiful t-shirt here. It's um, Jigang um, Damba, which is Strong Sister. Um, and we're promoting Strong Sister to Self, Strong Sister to each other, and family, and to the community. So we're about leadership and really creating those opportunities for our young ones to step up into leadership. And they've done this today, so it's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Um, to the last, this is the first time that they've performed and I'm really, really proud of them. We're going to sing another song for you, but we want to also mention that the theme to NAIDOC this year is Healing Land. So to us, when we talk about Healing Land, we talk about all as a whole. And even though we've had some um, pretty big cleansing through the fire and through the floods, there's still a lot that we need to move from the land in the way of healing, of coming together more in a unified approach about what's happening within our communities in society today. It's about ha having that connection, you know, talking up, doing the networking, so we can share um, for, me, for us the bigger voice uh, about our culture, about looking after each other and looking after the land and what the land needs 
listening to the land. And it's about that naranga, which is the deep listening, that we really need to sit in, in that really space with what is the land telling us? What does the land need? Because it's a really a reflection of us, what we need as a people. And so with our mob, we really, really need each other. You know, that's what makes us strong. So this is, um, song is, is about that, that connection to the land. And through our song lines, we, um, we heal each other. So we go move through, you know, our landforms and really acknowledge and honour Naya Parai, Mother Earth. So enjoy. Apologies from um, Nadega Mirren. Um, we have a, a pretty strong um, choir, but you know life gets in the way and work gets in the way. Um, so I, there's too many to to um, put the apologies in. But we're pretty excited to be backing up these beautiful um, girls today and really singing. Look, this choir we didn't start. Um, thinking that, you know, we had a voice. We're all going, ah, shame, yeah. hiding behind each other. But what we re re uh, recognised in singing, it actually gave us a bigger voice and it really made our voice strong. So we've been singing together for about six years, but what we've recognised within the group, we've grown in ways that we couldn't even imagine. Some of the women that do sing in the choir um, suffer from ha um, high anxiety, depression, and it's really brought the women out of the house and really made a strong connection. And we just can't talk it up enough about singing. Um, not that I'm going to do a solo or anything, but, um, but it, it does make your voice stronger. So we really want to pass this down to um, the next generation and say, don't be ashamed, step into your power and use your voice. So in the spirit of that, I just want um, the, the girls to have an opportunity to use their voice and introduce themselves. Hello everyone, my name is Tanisha. I'm a Warama Zero Prime Dungari girl. Hello, my name is Chloe. I'm a Dungari Zero Prime Warama woman. Hi, my name is Pamela and I am a Zero Prime Dungari girl. Hi, my name is Shantae and I'm a Zero Prime girl. Hello, my name is Layla and I'm a Birupai Wurumai Dungari girl. Hello everyone, I'm Emily and I'm a Birupai girl. Hi, I'm Kai and I'm a Birupai girl. Hi, I'm Charlie and I'm a Rajri girl. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much for having us in the day. We feel quite blessed and honoured to have the opportunity to sing in our tongue language to you. Beautiful. Let's put our hands together again, folks. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure that there were some um, amazing healing words there and some entertainment again there. So thank you so much there to the uh, Narragun Miram Women's Choir. Okay, so now we're on to the big wigs. And I use those words in dearly because um, often I think the work that you guys do day in, day out often goes unrecognised. Um, and, and I think when you've got someone like a minister 
turn up to your event, it says something. It says that what you guys are doing day in, day out is important. It's important to the economy, it's important to the community, and it's important to our state. So that being said, I'd like to introduce to you our minister, um, who is going to be sharing with you some interesting things. So the Honourable Stuart Ayres MPs, the Minister for Jobs, Investment, Tourism and Western Sydney, uh, he was elected to the Parliament in 2010, representing the seat of Panther. Um, Panthers? Go Panthers! <laughs> uh, he, he's committed to achieving the New South Wales government target of creating 250,000 jobs over the next four years, which is an awesome task, I think. And as Minister for Tourism, he's responsible for delivering the Visitor Economy Strategy for 2030. And I'm sure we'd all like to find out more about that. The strategy sets a bold vision for New South Wales to be the premier visitor economy in the whole of the Asia Pacific, which is an awesome, bold goal. And I love bold thinkers. Can you please, let's put back into that um, awesome some uh, pageant, Christmas pageant type of clapping for the minister as they come up to stage. Thanks, Niels. Um, the member for Panthers, I'll cop that. Uh, last night I was uh, enjoying some New South Wales wine and some fantastic local seafood and a young girl, Hayley, seven years old, came up to me in the restaurant and renamed my portfolio as the boss of holidays. Uh, and I thought, I'm going to take that back to the Premier. That's a pretty good title to have. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you um, very much for being part of this conference, supporting the work that local government does. Can I too make my recognition of the local Indigenous communities, the Barapai people, um, and thank them for their custodianship of the land. As someone who's come from Durrig country today, and I know that where everyone has travelled from from around New South Wales, we are all guests on this country. And I think given the choir we've just seen, we know how important this Indigenous culture is to the land, but particularly uh, to the areas that we are all passionate about. The fundamental principle of tourism is about sharing experiences. And people travel all over the world. They travel to their next clan, their next suburb, their next city, their next state, their next country to experience what people from that location that they're visiting is all about. It's a critical part of our strategy for visitor economy leading towards 2030 to ensure that Indigenous experiences are embedded in all of the things that we do in this state. It is fundamentally the one cultural connection that we all share. As a truly multicultural nation made up of people that have come from across the globe, the one culture that we all share is our strong Indigenous culture and our connection to our land. It's the one thing that we get to share with the rest of the world and it's the one thing that we should all be immensely proud of. I think this is a particularly important message as we work through Reconciliation Week. It moves us beyond the concept of reconciliation from a symbol to making it actually a practical outcome that empowers Indigenous Australians and creates a strong dividend for all Australians as well. Tourism is a way of delivering on that. So here we all are at a local government conference. The first thing I want to say to all of you is how important the role of local government is in delivering good quality visitor experiences. Often you play a role as the first port of call for many people visiting a local community. You're often a role as an enabler, and I'll touch more on that principle. You're also someone who brings together both government and private sector activities and communities. In many respects, you're the group of people at the coalface, at the street level of the visitor experience, particularly from a government perspective. If we think about the role of the Commonwealth Government being presenting the case for visiting Australia on the world stage, at the state level, it's about ensuring that we market and promote and create fantastic events for people to come and visit New South Wales and choose for New South Wales citizens to experience their own state. And we're going through that as I think one of the silver linings that exist from this insidious COVID pandemic that we continue to work through. At the local government level, it's earthy, it's close to the ground, it's close to communities, it's close to individual operators. And so it's crucial that we recognise at the state government level how important your role is in making sure we create fantastic experiences for people who are moving across New South Wales, who are visiting New South Wales from other states, and particularly as we come out of the COVID pandemic, 
and people start to return to international travel, the role that you, you, you play in sharing those local experiences to international visitors to Australia. So what does that actually mean? Where do we actually work together? And I think the big challenge for local government is to really understand its role as an enabler, an enabler of allowing and facilitating tourism activity in your local communities. One of the big challenges that I've set for Destination New South Wales as we enter our second decade as an organisation is to not just be a marketing and events agency, but to be an organisation that can collaborate across other parts of government to create a better visitor experience. Now, the fundamental function of government is to improve the quality of life for our citizens. They're the people that we serve. They vote for us at elections, they pay our taxes, they pay our rates, fundamentally they pay our salaries, and our role is to continue to serve them and create better experiences. But a visitor doesn't fall into that category. They don't pay a rate, they don't vote in an election, but they make a fundamental and critical contribution to our local community. So I think if we're really breaking down this concept of local government or government completely as an enabler, the first and most critical principle that we have to adopt is thinking of the visitor as a citizen. Exactly the same way we think about a person who uses our local transport, our local health system, our local community services, uh, all of the things that we do to improve the lot and life and livelihoods of our citizens, we should think exactly the same way around the visitor. Fundamentally, their choice to come to our home, to our country, our region, is because they want to experience what we're experiencing. And so there's an onus on government to think about the visitor as a citizen. And if you do that, immediately what you start to do is recognise that this visitor is a contributor to our community. They're an economic contributor, they're a social contributor, they're a person who adds value to our communities. I think this becomes a really critical message. I think too often, we often see visitors as a person who is coming into our community, but they're not one of us. If you think about just the concept of being Australian, if you think about being the concept of a good neighbour, the idea of welcoming someone into your home is about sharing that personal and welcoming experience. That's something that we have to ingrain into our DNA. Moving beyond that, I think there's an, a, a bigger challenge for us. And that bigger challenge is recognising that collaboration and competition can coexist in exactly the same world. Increasingly, we've seen through the course of the pandemic where businesses have had to change, they've had to pivot, they've had to adapt. They've also retreated back into their own communities. Citizens have not been able to travel around the world. Businesses have had to think differently about customers. And we've recognised that there is a distinct benefit by working closely with other people who do the same thing that we do. Now, historically, that's often meant we've thought about them as a competitor. If you're a coffee shop on the same street as another coffee shop, you're a competitor. If you're a hotel in the same city as another hotel, you're a competitor. But what about if we broke down this level of competition and thought about it as a community? If we thought about the tourism community as a community that can share experiences, can share understandings, can be, can be a singular or stronger voice for its advocacy both to government and to the community. I love the idea of competition. It drives better quality products, it drives better quality experiences, and it drives better productivity across business. It's a fundamental part of a functioning and strong economy. But that doesn't mean that we can't engage with each other. And so I think a substantial challenge for local government to overcome is the concept of boundaries, the concepts of your individual boundaries. The citizen thinks about those because of the structures that we've put in place, but the visitor doesn't. The visitor doesn't think about which local government area they are visiting. They're visiting a region, the Port Macquarie region, the Riverina, the North Coast, Western Sydney, Sydney. It doesn't matter which one of those brands that we all think about, they're not thinking about a local government region. So you can invest your ratepayers' funds back into local government support for tourism, but it doesn't have to be ingrained in the concept of your local government boundary. 
So I want to challenge every single one of you, whether you're an elected official as a councillor or whether you're a passionate advocate for tourism in your local government as an official or someone working in a tourism board or a visitor centre, is to challenge yourself to ask the question about how can we work better with the people next door? How can we work better with the adjoining local government so that our message to the visitor is better coordinated and we create better experiences for those visitors? Because there isn't a checkpoint Charlie from one local government area to the next. Mayor's photos um, and councillor photos and minister's photos don't really mean much to the visitors that are coming from other states, that are coming from other countries. And what visitors want is they want the curated experience. They want to know how they drive from one location to the next. They want to know how they go uh, on the tour from one location to the next. And they genuinely do not care if they cross a local government boundary. So, fundamentally, we have to understand that whilst we're all there to represent the people that have elected us, whilst we all have our own boundaries that we've got to function in from an organisational and operational perspective, we can tear down those boundaries, we can tear down those walls when it comes to driving a better quality visitor experience. So competition is good, but competition with strong collaboration is even better. That competition then drives your performance. The sense of collaboration allows you to expand the offering that you give to a visitor, and it also delivers a stronger economic dividend to your local community. You don't have to be afraid of the adjoining local government. I don't have to be afraid of the Commonwealth government because we're largely all trying to do the same thing. If you walk away from this conference over the next two days with the experiences from the speakers that you've heard from, with the ideas that are going to be flowing through your brain, the way you want to change your strategic plan, the way you want to interact and engage with your local community and your local government leadership, Make sure you take with you that there's an opportunity to work with a person in the adjoining council to do exactly the same thing and expand your offering. And there's never been a better time to do it. We've seen off the back of the global pandemic a resurgence, particularly in regional travel. New South Wales is a star in this space. It's empirical data that shows us this. Regional tourism is recovering stronger in New South Wales than it is in Victoria and New South Wales. DNSW research shows that, Roy Morgan research shows that, and our own data and expenditure tracking through our relationship with Westpac is showing the same thing as well. In most regional locations, visitor expenditure is now higher than what it was in pre-pandemic levels. It's a wonderful thing that Australians are rediscovering their backyard. But we shouldn't just think because the borders are going to open that everything's going to go back to the way it is or the way it was before. We've been granted this wonderful opportunity to create some loyalty with new customers. It's just unusual they're all Australian. It's just an unusual thing that these new customers are all Australians. It's a somewhat random stat for Australia, a relatively small nation on the world stage, 28 million people, that we're a trade deficit nation when it comes to the visitor economy. In very simple terms, that means Australians spend more money travelling overseas than what the world, with about six billion people, spends travelling here. That's something we've all got to work on. But whilst we've got this opportunity to re-engage with Australians, we should be fundamentally asking ourselves how do we create some brand and customer loyalty amongst this new group of customers that we've got. Yes, they'll travel back overseas again, but they'll also be able to weigh up the choice to travel overseas against an experience that they've had over the last 12 months. We should definitely not let that opportunity pass. The final point that I would say is that we also want to continue to challenge the regulations and the laws that we, that we utilise in the state and across local governments. Post the bushfires, I conducted a round table of local governments across the south coast to really test the concept of whether we could break down barriers around the visitor economy. And to that end, Minister Stokes has gone through the consultation on opening up things like farm gates to do more activity, break down some of those red tape barriers so that we don't have to think about individual sites through a very rigid prism of regulation. We want to be able to be more responsive to what customers want. And I think from a local government perspective, and this is something that I challenge my ministerial colleagues, I challenge Destination New South Wales, and I challenge myself every single day, 
is how do we make our regulatory environment in New South Wales better for the visitor? Not better for the government, not better um, for a local government, but better for the visitor. And we have to ask ourselves that question at the local government level as well. What are the things that we can change in our structural makeup? What are the things we can change in our regulatory framework that puts the visitor in the same category as the citizen? Rather than seeing the visitor as a drawdown on resources, they should be seen as the value add that they actually are. There is no doubting that value add. Economically, they are the strongest value add we see outside of our own individual citizens. So we've been presented with an amazing opportunity, a surging regional New South Wales, a strong foundation from which to re-engage in the international market. In the first three months of the pandemic, New South Wales shed 272,000 jobs. 272,000 jobs. As of last month, all 272,000 jobs had been recovered. Now, we know that across the economy, the job recovery is patchy. Some areas have recovered strongly, other areas are recovering more weakly. We also know that there's a skills displacement that is right across the sector. So there's a challenge for us to be able to ensure that we continue to reinforce the visitor economy and tourism as a strong career path for all Australians, young and old. This isn't just about engaging new employees. This is about engaging the people that have been disrupted by a once in a century global pandemic and we can talk to them about working in the visitor economy and sharing their skills and their experiences. If we do that, we'll be able to build a much stronger workforce and the one that's more globally resilient. But we all have a role to play there. There's not a cafe, a hotel, a visitor experience, a tour operator that doesn't have a job vacancy right now. They can't literally access enough workers. So it's incumbent on all of us to make sure that we talk about this sector from a career perspective and not just a short-term job perspective. There are plenty of opportunities for us to work with Australians and when our borders reopen, there is no, ground, no doubt migrants will continue to play a role in this, but we want to be able to make sure that for every skilled migrant that comes in, we create more jobs for Australians. That's the principle that has seen us grow as a nation for nearly 70 years post the Second World War. So we stand here in, a, in an incredibly exciting opportunity. Coming off the back of a global pandemic, where we've managed it really well, particularly by global standards. But when our borders reopen, when we have the world coming back in, we've got to challenge ourselves to keep Australians here a little bit longer with good quality product and good quality experiences. As governments, we've got to continue to challenge ourselves to make the visitor as important as the citizen, because they deliver just as important an economic value. And that can't just be a statement that's got to turn itself into practical policy application and changes to regulation. And then the final point is break down the barriers, break down the borders. To, this, to the visitor, they are largely irrelevant. Compete with each other by all means. Test, challenge, drive each other, create better quality experiences. But if you collaborate along the way, you will provide much, much better outcomes for your own communities and you'll provide much better experiences. Later in this forum, you'll hear from Steve Cox, the CEO of Destination New South Wales. He will dive much more deeply into our Visitor Economy 2030 strategy, so you can understand more deeply and richly about how we're going to work with local government on that. And my final message would be to encourage as many of the businesses in your local communities to engage with the New South Wales FIRST program. It's for all intents and purposes a professional development program for businesses operating in your local communities. You're going to go and visit the winery and the maze later today. They are a business that benefited from it being engaged in New South Wales FIRST because the Port Macquarie Council here scooped up a group of local operators, put them through the New South Wales FIRST program and now they've been able to really strengthen their product offering. That business is stronger for the professional development work that it's been through. That's a good little piece of homework for every single one of you to take home. Thanks very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. And can I say from the bottom of my heart, thank you for being passionate about tourism. This is something that, this is a sector that I absolutely adore. I love what it does to our communities. I love how it strengthens our economy. But these things only happen because there's dedicated, passionate people 
working in businesses where they've got a chance to share those experiences and they only get an opportunity because there are dedicated, passionate people for tourism operating in local government. Hold on to that passion. Hold on to that commitment. Shout it from the rooftop and be passionate about it in your local government. If you do that, you'll break down those barriers, you'll create better forums for competition and you'll be much more collaborative and across the way, New South Wales will be better for it. Have a great day. Let's make some noise. And I think I'm Yes, I think you should declare that one as well. You don't want to get into trouble. But um, some beautiful local produce there for you, Minister. <laughs> That's right, no pen folds. Um, a couple of the key takeaways I got there from Minister Eyre, or sorry, Minister Eyre's uh, Minister for the Panthers. Um, some of the big takeaways I got from that was um, visit, viewing our, I guess, our visitors as citizens. And I think that's a really important part. And the other big takeaway I got was that their boundaries, um, that regions don't really have boundaries according to the visitor. And I love that concept of change. We mentioned that earlier on, there is going to be a lot of change. So again, please um, put your hands together again once for Minister Ayres. All right, so now we've got the good fortune of recognising and rewarding some of the amazing work that's been done in Tourism New South Wales um, by, by you, you guys as local government um, areas. And I'd like to invite up to the stage um, Greg Binskin. If you don't know about Greg, he's the EM of Tourism Business New South Wales and him and um, Minister Ayres are going to be presenting the New South Wales Tourism Industry Council Top Tourism Town Award. A little bit more about Greg, he, um, he is, a working really hard to try and make sure that the visitor economy and the supporting supply chain of goods and services remain a top priority. Greg's experience spans well over 30 years and he's worked in both the private and public sector in tourism, providing product development, innovative marketing programs and the delivery of modern visitor services. Let's get some energy going. It's a Christmas pageant once more. Up there, Greg. Uh, thanks, everyone, and um, welcome to this morning. I know the minister's on a tight schedule, so we're going to try and get through this quite quickly. But on behalf of the New South Wales Tourism Industry Council, I'm thrilled here, to, here today to be at this conference where we're going to announce the winners of the highly and highly commended awards for the inaugural, the first time we've actually run the New South Wales top tourism towns. It's a real testament to the resilience of the towns that in our first year, we have an incredible 42 finalists. They're all listed there in two categories, a population over 5,000 residents and those under 5,000 residents. The awards, as the minister talked about, are all about community collaboration. Groups such as the local chambers, tourist association, councils and visitor centres have come together, wow, come together, to showcase their town as a tourism destination worthy of celebrating. The process was really highly competitive, with entrants submitting really exceptional videos, images and some great editorial that we actually be able to use in the media. They're accompanied by a three and four day itinerary. It was great to see so many of these towns embrace the Top Tourism Town Award. The awards really acknowledge the enormous work being done by regional towns to attract visitors and to really support that supply chain of the local businesses and the economy, not only jobs, but all the goods and services that are supported by the tourism industry or the visitor economy. I'd like to thank the judging committee, they had the hard task, I didn't, of selecting the finalists. And then we put it out to the people. We put it out and we had 15,000 people vote online to support their town. That's community engagement. The number and quality entries is remarkable, an exciting example of what New South Wales has to offer. So just before announcing the winners, I know it's short and I'm stretching it here, we've got this compilation of what we had to go through to see what our great state has. So enjoy. The towns, of the, the, the towns will come up and uh, you're allowed to applaud. Yeah. 
Thank you. A really big round of applause. It was really welcome because this is what we received. We didn't create that. There was no ad, ad agency given to us to go out and do that. That was you, the community, pulled these things together from all your compilations. So, yeah, I, I, I really was astounded by what we received. Now, look, in any awards, there's always those challenges of who's, who's going who's to win. And, um, look, Today, just I don't, and to get some photographs with the minister, only just the winners, the two winners, to come up, please. But I'm going to announce the judges had a tough time, so they broke it down. They wanted to put some judges' choice awards, and these certificates you'll be able to pick up from our stand um, in the exhibition area. So the most inspiring editorial went to Oberon. <laughs> The most captivating video went to Tumbarumba. And the most compelling itinerary went to Edelong Beach. Now, before I call up the boss of holidays, as Hayley calls you, um, the boss of holidays, we've had to get to the point of too highly commended. It was a very close battle out, and the highly commended for the, for the tourism town population of less than 5,000 residents, went to Carcor. <laughs> and the highly commended for the population of over 5,000 went to Orange. <laughs> the boss of holidays can announce the winners. I've got nothing against ACDC and Madonna, but maybe this should be like a Taylor Swift or maybe even an Ed Sheeran uh, type uh, round of applause. But for the town with less than 5,000 population, the winner is Berrimer. Congratulations, Berrima. Uh, and the, um, I think we're calling this at least the Taylor Swift um, recognition. Uh, so really big round of applause for the top town with a population of greater, five, greater than 5,000 goes to Mudgee. Congratulations to uh, everyone who is involved in the Tourism Top Town Awards, um, to Greg and the work that's come from Business New South Wales. Thank you once again for your leadership and coordination and recognition of that. I think we saw the sheer quality of not just the productions but the experiences that are available. Um, thank you for having me here today. To my colleague Leslie Williams, um, thank you for your passionate advocates of this community. I know Jenny you weren't here when the original introductions were being done uh, but thank you for coming along and showing uh, your support for the sector. I know the forum's going to hear from you tomorrow uh, but keep up the great work and keep promoting New South Wales tourism. Thank you very much. Beautiful. So as we're waiting for our next speaker to come up and just set up here, Craig, if I can invite you along, I want to talk to you a little bit about our next guest. But before we do that, I know we've been sitting down for a little bit of time. Um, let's get up. Let's get up on our feet. Damn it, he's interactive. Up on your feet. Yep, 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 yep. 
<laughs> okay, what are we going to do? Um, in my previous career, some people will like pack shells at Woolworths at night time. I would teach yoga, so I look good in short pants, but um, my wife doesn't like me sharing that anymore. Uh, but what I want you to do is to grab your put the person next to you, not their pants, but their hands. So you're holding both of their hands. Yep. Uh, I know, I know, it's all right. And a little bit of a forwards and backwards, like you're doing a little bit of a fist there, yes. You can do one arm if you've got a menage a trois going. Five seconds, a little bit faster. Four, three, two, one. Okay. Winding it up there. Beautiful. Uh, give your person a high five. Yes. Turn the person behind you or in front of you. Give them a high five. Remember it. And let's take a seat. Beautiful. Now, raise your hands if you would love to be able to peer into the future. Let's say it's five or ten years from now. Just honestly, raise your hands if you would like that. Yeah? Some of you have perfection already. Okay? Raise your hand if you're not going to raise your hand no matter what I ask tonight or today. <laughs> yeah, I know what you guys have in the back seat there. Um, so I want to, I'm really excited about our next speaker, Craig Grisman. I've known Craig for probably 16 or 17 years. It's kind of pretty scary. But what I love about whenever I catch up with Craig Grisman and is that he's a futurist. So the way I often describe him to my clients, because we do a lot of work together, is I think, think of Steve Jobs and then mix him with Nostradamus and he's somewhere in between. And, and that's not a big call because actually I think when Craig was still a teenager, maybe 13 or 14 or something like that, he was working for Apple and Steve Jobs came up to him and said, hey, you know, Craig, I don't think you should go to college. You should just stay working for us at Apple. And that was testimony to part of his technical technology experience and I think that has really stayed with him for a long time. Yes, he does work with PCs as well. He's not just a Mac guy. Um, so a little bit about Craig. He's the founder of an awesome organisation called the Future Trends Group. And he works around the world with all kinds of industries and organizations, from your techs, your biotech, manufacturing, mining, finance, local government associations, and everything like that. And what he's really going to do with you today is share with you how you can look into the future. Now, here's the thing. A lot of people think, oh, how can he predict the future? Based on my experience and knowledge of working with Craig, I reckon he's got probably about a 95% strike rate. So that means whatever he says today, it is probably 95% going to work for you. So please take as many notes as you can. Um, on the other side, the way I wanted to think about Craig is he's is one of the most giving people I know as keynote speakers. Um, he really does have a lot to share. So let's do the Taylor Swift thing. And I want you to get your hands up in here because that's probably what I think. You know, if you've got the lighters, maybe do that. Up with the hands, a little bit over the side. Let's get some going. And stomp your feet. Stomp the feet. Excellent. And bring the hands together. Awesome applause for Mr. Craig Rispin. Thank you very much. You guys probably don't know this, but uh, Nils and I have worked for the largest council in, the ca in Australia. Largest? Well, this council manages a small area called Arnhem Land. That's a pretty big area. That's not the area that they only cover. Uh, I want to talk to you about catering for the future visitor. And I thought, oh, Oh, that's great. I know about catering. I work in the food industry <laughs> as well. And just uh, two weeks ago, I was talking on the future of food. And I thought, you know, it's really difficult in regional areas to get uh, staff working in kitchens. And the good news is that Molly, I don't know if you know Molly, uh, launched, uh, you can actually buy this robot and put it into your kitchen. So here's Mo Molly, and she's going to cook for you. She can store about. Um, uh, about 5,000 recipes. And even better than that, she'll do the dishes when she's done. <laughs> Who would love to have somebody cook for you and do the dishes? Yeah, and when I'm talking to regional uh, uh, hospitality and restaurants, they're really struggling to get staff. And you won't believe that uh, you're going to be able to hire this robot to cook in your kitchen or in your home kitchen and they're just going to rent it to you by the hour, $22.50 an hour. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? Think about the world that we're living in. And in fact, in the United States, they did this study, and they found that the economy's back, just like here in the regional areas when it comes to uh, visitors. But hiring troubles, same in America, 
But this is what we found, that the goods and economy and services are actually higher than pre-COVID in America. And you know America suffered a lot more than we have in Australia. And look at this, it's producing roughly the same amount of goods and services before Corona, but with 8.2 million fewer workers in the workplace. This is the boost, the boost of the uh, economy. And I just want to tell you, I'm really here to help you, to serve you, because I think it's impossible pl to plan for the future unless you're a little bit like a futurist yourself. Why don't you steal some of the tools that we have in our community? Do you know who makes up our community? There's about 24,000 futurists in the Peak Industry Association. About a third are academics and researchers. A third are from the government and from NGOs. And yes, we'd invite you to join us. Forward-looking leaders in government are members of the World Future Society. And the third are from the commercial world. That's where I come from. And I really want to serve you. But I find it hard when people don't have open minds. So I went back to school to study to try and you know what Nils was talking about, we have to have this energy and open minds. And so I thought, what technique could I use? And I learned this technique, I don't know if you've heard about it, it's called tapping, they use it for emotional therapy. Would everybody follow along with me? Everybody take out your index fingers and just tap like this. Not like this, you'll confuse yourself. <laughs> Together, and then we're gonna have a mantra. The mantra is going to be, I'll say it first, I have an open mind. Now all of you, I have an open mind. You clearly do because I just made that up. <laughs> <laughs> but an open mind is really needed to accept some of the things I'm gonna be sharing with you. But I have a slide pack, Nils will tell you, of 1,879 slides to back up any of these claims that I'm making if you question that they're not true. This has been researched, I've got all the stats, and it's been peer reviewed by hundreds of futurists. It's not just my opinion. So let's look at this. We were already going through massive change before COVID. I don't know if you know this, but we were transferring from one economy to a new one. We were transferring from the third industrial revolution to the fourth. And at the launch of this fantastic book called, in fact, The Fourth Industrial Revolution, there was our leader sitting in the very front row, right here. There he was, ScoMo, in the front row, getting a copy of this book. And he even blogged about it. This was before he was prime minister. And he said, we have to be committed to moving our economy, economy to the fourth industrial revolution. Now, if you don't know about this, it's changing everything. The third industrial revolution was based on two C's. What two C's were the third industrial revolution? Coal. Coal? <laughs> Computers and communication. That really defined our last economy. And the new one is the combination, the merging of the digital world now we call it, because it's not just computers and communication. We've got AR, we've got VR, we have AI. We have a lot of uh, two-letter acronyms and three-letter acronyms that we use in the technology industry to confuse you so you have to hire us. <laughs> uh, but I want to recommend that if you aren't a futurist yet, that you should read this and join us. Because this book that I'm going to recommend, which is the one that ScoMo blogged about, actually talks about this change and goes to the community of the World Economic Forum and was peer reviewed and the research was based and published in this book. So hands up if you read this book, The Fourth Industrial Revolution. You, one hand, two hands in the room. Um, thank you. Would you recommend it for everybody else? What was the best thing about the book? Do you remember? Um, oh, I think it was just the excitement. 
The excitement, yes, I have one chief executive. He says, when I ever run into a negative Ned or a negative Nelly in my business, I have got a box full of these books in my trunk. I give them a copy of, my, of this book. I said, read this, and in a month's time, I'll have a cup of coffee with you. And they completely changed their attitude. Would you say that that has that, that effect? So everyone, grab your phone, because here's a QR code. You can get the book right now. And if you get it on Amazon, if you scan that QR code, you get it on Amazon, you get the Kindle version. And you can also get the audio book. And do you know, as you flick through the Kindle version reading, when you go to the, you know, to the gym, or you can listen on the audio book, and they're perfectly synchronized. <laughs> Did you know that? When you get done listening, it gets to the right page. It's called Whisper Sync. It's super cool. <laughs> super cool. So get that book. But if you just want an executive summary, who wants the executive summary? <laughs> <laughs> The executive summary is the fourth industrial revolution is not just computers and communication. It is that world of the digital plus the biological and the physical world. Now, I want to show you why this is so important. It's because we wouldn't have been able to get a COVID vaccine if it wasn't for the fourth industrial revolution. In fact, I was talking to many doctors that were on the front line developing these vaccines, and they were saying, it's like we invented the technology to solve COVID before COVID just then just arrived. I mean, think about it. We have two new mRNA vaccines that couldn't have existed because until the, this. I'll show you what this chart shows. It shows the price per, uh, performance of computer chips versus this new way of doing chips and biology on a chip, literally a lab on a chip. So if you look at Moore's law, this has defined the last 50 years of the IT industry, this exponential curve. And because we've been in COVID times, we're really good at looking at exponential curves on logarithmic scales. That's down the left-hand side there. And you want to keep on that line. So that's Moore's Law showed that the, at, back in uh, 2001, a $10 million computer by 2019 was $10,000. But I know what line you're all looking at. You're looking at that orange line. And this is why when they say, hey, we're just going to do a COVID test on you, and we're just going to genetically um, scan it. Do you know how they can afford to do that? Because back in 2001, it cost $10 million per test. Thanks to the fusion of digital and biology that exploded with acceleration, those tests now cost less than 10 cents. Have you figured out that we've been doing millions of those tests in this country and we can afford it because they're 10 cents? Has anybody told you this? This is thanks to the fourth industrial revolution. And here's a primer. It's a fourth industrial revolution. It's a fusion of the physical, the digital, and the biological world. It's changing not only what we are doing, it's changing who we are. It's really the notion of digital technology pervasively impacting every walk of life and every vertical industry on all parts of the globe. Whether it's information technology and the acceleration we see in artificial intelligence, a lot is happening. Society and how we're going to live is being defined right now. So speed is mind-boggling. What I'm particularly concerned about is how little the world is prepared. Harnessing this revolution requires the involvement of all stakeholders, from public and private sectors to academia and civil society. The World Economic Forum Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution Network ensures that the development and application of emerging technologies benefits both people and the planet. It is a network of centers for scalable impact, with locations in the United States, Japan, India, and China, bringing together stakeholders to identify the impacts of these technologies, co-design innovative governance protocols and policy frameworks, and pilot them with partners around the world. 
If we are not innovative, if we're not creative enough, it will be very difficult to survive in this century. Humans and machines are assisting each other, augmenting each other with skills. Humanity itself will be changed with this super intelligence, and we are at the doorstep of that era. The technologies available today will impact and change healthcare forever. 52% of the encounters with our primary care physicians were handled virtually. Just a massive of change. The network will work closely to share research, analysis and learning and help design new technologies in ways that respect societal values. It's where innovation is happening about how we guide this revolution. We can solve the many of the social issues through the digital technology. My hope is that we have a robust discussion for how this can truly help our world solve some of the hard-pressed challenges that we have today. Together, we can shape a future that truly benefits and empowers people. The world has changed. We can never, ever go back to yesterday. And that was before COVID. What happened next? What happened next was in the next six months from March, then six months, many, many industries advanced what they were doing, including digital communication that you've heard a lot about already. These companies were surveyed, 3,000 of them, and asked them, how has COVID accelerated your digital communication strategy? And the average was six years. So turn to the learning person, your BFF, next to you, and ask them the question, did you accelerate your digital communication strategy six years in six months? You have 15 seconds to discuss. Your time begins now. Five, four, three, two, one. Let me just quiz you. What do you think increased 3,300% uh, since last year? 12 months ago, it was pretty big. Then it advanced 3,300%. Would anybody like to guess what company or product or service? What, Zoom? Yeah, <laughs> you got it in one. Zoom meetings increased 3,300%. And in fact, look at the growth of this company. Back in December of 2013, they had 200 million annual meeting minutes. Fiscal year, quarter two, uh, down there, second from the bottom, two trillion. The next quarter, 3.3 trillion annual meeting minutes on this platform. And that wasn't the only thing. Everything changed, including visitors' attitudes. Yesterday, a thought leader, a futurist, visionary, local government, tourism leader, inspired students and industry to create artificial humans to be tourism welcomers when the information kiosk was closed. Have a look at this. Ladies and gentlemen, meet my AI friend, Neon. Hi, I'm Neon. Artificial human, it's a little bit different from an AI. I was computationally created based on how real humans look and behave. Every human has a unique personality, emotion, and intelligence. I'll help you find your style. I'll let you know what's happening around you. I'll guide your journey. I'll help you find your inner peace. I'll be someone you'll share your idea with. My dream is to help humans become even more human than ever before. 
This technology isn't to replace us. This is to empower us to be superhumans. I asked my AI assistant, Athena. I said, Athena, how many sources are you scanning? And she answered, 688,905 sources I have on the future of tourism. I said, Athena, can you summarize those for me? Can you categorize them for me? Can you share them with my peers and ask them to comment if they have experience in uh, tourism, in placemaking, in wayfinding? And so I went into Athena and she produced this report in a tenth of a second. I don't know how you guys do your future planning, but do you play, employ an AI that can scan 688,000 sources in a tenth of a second? This is what futurists do and you should steal our ideas. Here's the report, and one of the headlines I like to see, uh, full disclosure, I'm an investor in this company. Virgin Galactic plans to start providing commercial space travel for customers by 2023. All you need is a million frequent flyer miles. I'm almost halfway there. Who's going with me? <laughs> um, here it's showing with some charts and graphs how people are feeling about the industry right now, globally, in Australia, and around the world. And this is a, an external SWOT analysis. And it shows that there are uh, almost a third of all the reports are talking about emerging opportunities that are new, not business as usual, usual but emerging opportunities for the tourism sector. And this shows that optimism is actually up. You see that curve going up? Do you feel optimistic about the future? Of course. Well, why, you'd just give up if you didn't, right? <laughs> That's the idea. So here are the top trends in tourism that successful strategy plans must include. And so if you have a, an existing strategy plan, do you have an existing strategy plan? Just check to see how many of these are on your, exec, on your current strategy plan, which ones you might need to add, and which ones you might need to take off. Here are the, here are the top trends. Uh, so we, uh, in the futurist industry, you might know that we use uh, models. The model that I'm using uh, this, uh, this morning is the STEEP model, social, technological, environmental, economic, and political slash legal. Let's talk about the social trend. I went into the World Economic Forum and I said, what are, uh, so Athena alerted me to this report, said that the number one shift in the future visitor is future demographics, obviously. <laughs> so if you drill down into this beautiful, I just love these, uh, uh, these uh, infographics that they produce. It says that you must think about, when you think about your future visitor, think about your future visitor Think about the demographics. And if there's one futurist in Australia that is the champion of producing beautiful infographics around demographics, it's fellow futurist Mark McCrindle. Do you know Mark McCrindle? Produces this fantastic free resource that you can get at mccrindle.com. And this shows the age wave that we're currently experiencing in Australia. Did you know that we had a peak record birth numbers? Did you know? And it wasn't because of COVID. It happened before COVID. <laughs> and then we had another baby bump, if you know what I mean. And so uh, he also pr uh, provides this uh, content that talks about their different leadership styles between the builders, the baby boomers, Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z, and the new generation. What do we call them? Generation Alpha. And I love to see that the leadership style of Generation Alpha is to inspire others. Not command and control, but to inspire others. Young people have contributed uniquely to domestic travel. In fact, there's one um, title that I like that sum ups their, their uh, way of thinking, and I love it because it's called selectively splurging. Do you know what selectively splurging is? It's like um, you go onto Airbnb and you try and find the cheapest place you possibly can. And then you go out for the best Wagyu steak. 
or vice versa. You get a really great venue, like the venue that we're in here, and then you say, oh, we're gonna go cook a couple snags on the barbie, right? That's, that's the idea of selectively splurging. And this is the way um, that this generation thinks. And in fact, the number one eating trend in this age group of uh, 14 plus uh, year olds, uh, flexitarians. You know what flexitarians are? I'm gonna be vegan all week and then I'm gonna have <laughs> that steak. <laughs> and it's interesting because they're searching for travel destinations, not on what if, necessarily, not on Expedia, but on Google Flights. Isn't that interesting? In fact, after COVID, Google Flights is the number one place for millennials to go looking for that flight. Just think about that. That behavior has changed quite significantly. Let's drill down into technology. Technology is transforming the tourism sector massively. You want to think that the, the iPhone had a big effect on your industry since 2007? You ain't seen nothing yet. Have a look at this. This is a preview for what augmented reality could look like in the future. Overloaded with ads, is it gonna look like that? Or are we gonna have another type of experience? This video was created to be a warning. This is what futurists do. We create dystopian views of the future that we don't want, not our preferable future. And this was created for that purpose. I'll tell you what happened next. While you were sleeping, did you know? While you were sleeping, Snapchat released some augmented reality goggles that um, influencers are grabbing to create unique travel experiences around your venues. Did you see this? Or were you sleeping? This is before Apple launches their augmented reality glasses. These still look like you've been to the doctor's office. <laughs> Do you think Apple's goggles are gonna look like that? No, and they're gonna be much more expensive. But imagine what you could do with this. Just imagine what you could do with this. Play. No. Try again. <laughs> I love New Mexico and I really wanted to sort of create a look from to New Mexico. I'm doing three lenses which are tied to road signs. AR is such an opportunity to create a more inclusive world. It's an opportunity to create a new way. The new generation spectacles are sunglasses that let you overlay a new reality on the world. I can build experiences that are on top of mountaintops or in the forest, and that has never been possible for me with this sort of technology before. My name is Lauren Kaysen, and I am an XR creative technologist. I love these historic road signs because they're so perfect for this kind of experience. There's sort of these funny, archaic things that have historic information about the particular site. A lot of them are maybe things we might want to update. So, for example, you can stand in front of that sign and hear poetry read aloud by a local New Mexico artist. Flame strips their branches. Flame sears their limbs. And I love the idea that through having this sort of experience with one of the signs, you might start seeing more of them and becoming more aware of your environment, and it might bring new life to this old way that we used to give people information. I want families on road trips to feel delight and wonder, and there is magic in the world and magic in old highway signs. I think it's important for artists to be some of the first ones who are making things with this. And having artists be a part of the conversation when these things are emerging, I think is going to create a, a kinder and gentler world. I'm going to create a world that is a little kinder and a little more empathetic, and where we're all looking at each other a little more. I back that. 
And you don't have to go overseas to find talented artists. There are local suppliers here in our community. Connect the dots between students who are learning these digital school uh, skills in K through 12 with industry, universities that are looking for commercial projects. Connect the dots. Ask, what do you want to see in the future of tourism in our area to young people? And you'll just be amazed with what they come up with and they can do it themselves. Uh, the Digital Creek, uh, Deep Creek Digital is a local startup that uh, produces these outdoor experiences based on existing signs. You may have seen the Malulubar Beach whale. Did you see this? No, not a beached whale. <laughs> A whale in the sky. Doesn't require QR codes, you just point at the sign, the sign becomes this AR experiences. It's really incredible. And uh, what if it rains in your area? You know you can still have augmented reality experiences from the car, scan the sign and get an education in the car, even in the rain. Have you thought about that? But technology has a downside as well. And luckily we have local startups that are helping us with the problem when your place falls off Google Maps. Did you hear that this town got deleted off Google Maps? It's really hard to promote tourism to your area when your town gets deleted. And some people think that Google is gospel. It is not gospel. It's not entirely a great mapping solution, is it? Imagine if your area got deleted. It's up to you to create a digital experience for these uh, visitors beyond where Google Maps, where it ends, could be a bet much better experience. And there's an Australian startup that's right in this space already. Navi's is digital wayfinding. And it's for creating your own maps with your own experience, not Google's. It's like when you get to the end of Google Maps, what happens once you get to that venue? Have you had that experience yourself? Have your visitors had that experience? They get to where the parking lot is, and they don't walk the 300 meters to where the outlook is, because they don't know it's only 300 meters. I have to say, as a frequent traveler to the regions all around Australia, there's lots of hidden secrets <laughs> that you need to be sharing with us. So here's a tool, Navi's, that can help you with this. It solves the problem of curation of your own maps and digital experiences. Watch this short demo. Welcome to the Navi's digital wayfinding demonstration. I'm going to show you three scenarios. The first scenario is a simple navigation from one place to another. The second scenario shows you how you can empower a visitor to find and get step-by-step -step directions to any kind of ad hoc destination or waypoint they need. And finally, I'm going to show you how you can embed other digital assets to amplify the desirability of your destination. So scenario one is a very simple navigation from the car park tunnel exit to the Hudos Bank Arena. I'm going to use the wheelchair access and I'm going to get directions. So you can see here, Navis has provided both you a visual cue of where to go, but also an estimation of the time and the distance of which you're going to walk. So let's say for scenario two, I've decided I need a quick stop off to the ladies' toilet. So I click on the tiles, click on the toilet category of locations, and you can see here on the map, there is a toilet on the way. I'm not sure if I'm going to make it. So if I click on it and ask for directions to here, you can see Navi's automatically recalculates. It's in fact a two minute walk. Luckily, I think I'm going to make it. <laughs> the final scenario I'm showing you today is how you can use different kinds of assets 
to improve the visibility of locations. The NAVE's digital wayfinding is built on a content management system and that allows you to build a map where imagine not only do you have normal places, spaces and directions, but layers of information of different types of accessibility or people with disabilities or amazing indigenous cultural experiences in exactly those places. The possibilities are endless and only limited by what you can come up with. And the exciting news is the CEO of this organization is sitting in the audience right now wearing that fantastic blue uh, jacket. Caroline, where are you? There, there's Caroline. Wave, everyone. There's Caroline. If you want to know more about this incredible app, talk to her. I love promoting Aussie startups. Aussie startups rock. I have to have a quick conversation with you about how we don't have Hyperloop in Australia because of lack of vision for, from our leaders. Imagine being a transport minister, not in this state, announcing a heavy rail project to go to the airport when it could be done on Hyperloop in three minutes and be completely off the grid. Imagine being the guest speaker at a conference to talk on the fourth industrial revolution on the day that the minister announced as a heavy rail project. And I'm talking about how in under an hour you can go from Brisbane to Sydney and have all those stops along the, the way. And it's the most sustainable energy solution. And it costs one tenth the price of high speed rail and even less than heavy rail. Why in the world do, are, aren't we already starting with Hyperloop. Turn to your neighbor and ask them, what the, why don't we have Hyperloop? is a remarkable new form of transportation that can whisk people from city to city in a flash. 29 minutes from New York to D.C., 30 minutes from L.A. to San Francisco. For years, we've been seeing these futuristic, utopian renderings of some cross between a spaceship We're and a monarch. We're from morning to 8 11, so we need to give them a But lately, the hiring Yeah, when, how long until you want me off? I think about five. It was surreal to be even sitting inside a Hyperloop and just even more incredible to actually be like riding down a track in something that was nothing more than a crazy idea six years before. Companies all around the world have been developing and testing the technology needed to propel passengers to speeds of over 1,000 kilometers per hour. But for many, speed is only the first step to unlocking the full transformational effects of a new mode of transportation. Fast is what we just sort of take for granted in the hybrid world. It's the network effects that will really deliver the benefit. And that opens up a completely different scale of economic opportunity. And it's linked to the environment. And your future vis visitors are highly motivated by environmental driven experiences. What we used to call ecotourism has now been transformed into more than that because they want, as inspiring young people, they want to be inspired as well. Travel with purpose now turns up 1.4 billion hits on Google. Do you rank? And finally, the political legal area. Can I ask you the question, who is the number one tax compliance collector in the world? Would you know this? Biggest tax collector for uh, tourism, you know, local regulations. Any, could, would anybody like to hazard a guess? Who is the biggest compliance officer, tax collector in the world? It's called Airbnb. Airbnb collects local taxes and manages compliance in 100,000 cities. How are you going with that? 
how would you like access to their data? I'm gonna have to finish up here, but here's Brian Chesney. I don't know if you know Brian Chesney. He's the founder of Airbnb. I don't know if you know, they banned parties in August of 2020. And now if there's a party at your property, all of your reviews vanish instantly if you're the host. And if you're an attendee, all your reviews vanish as well. One more time and you're off the platform. Would you like access to their data? Hands up if you'd like it. Great, he's rolling it out right now in 75 cities. Would you like to get on the waiting list? Go to the website, sign up for local city data. Local city data. And you know it's not just stays now, it's experiences. I've heard of new travel experience vendors that are making $100,000 in their first year and their only advertising venue is Airbnb experiences. Here's Brian Chetsney, I'm gonna just go play 60 seconds of it and then I'm gonna to have to get off stage because I'm running, running over time. Here's Brian. Conversation about the future of travel, including into rural areas and small towns. I'm glad to welcome the CEO of Airbnb, Brian Chesney. Uh, thanks so much for, for joining us. I have some questions about your business in the olden times and in the future times. I wanted to start with one big picture question. Of all of the enterprises that have been affected by the pandemic, yours has to be one of the most affected. You're about mobility, and people have not been mobile. What's the main lesson? or surprise or discovery that, that you personally have taken from the experience of the last eight months or so? We lost about 80% of our business in eight weeks, the business we spent about a decade building. Um, that was quite surprising. But the thing that may have been even more surprising is what happened next. And what happened next is that people, no matter the circumstances, in the midst of a pandemic, still had a desire to travel. They didn't want to get on planes. They weren't necessarily traveling for business. They didn't want to go to a crowded hotel, a tourist district, but they did want to get in a car and drive a tank of gas and go to another community and live in that community. And often, some of them you know, were getting homes in Airbnb. And so I think there's just this fundamental desire that people have to travel, to connect, to see the world. And I don't think that anything it, it can stop it, let alone a pandemic. Obviously, people have to do it responsibly, but there is still a very strong will to, to, to see the world. It just has to be done in a much narrower context right now because of the health and safety ramifications. Something that's fascinating about Airbnb is it's a new way of doing something that people have done for a very long time, of travel, lodging, uh, seeing different parts of the world. And because it's been done for such a long time, there's a large structure of regulations and tax um, arrangements and all the other ways in which the lodging industry has historically been regulated. The fact that you're doing that in a new way has led to some tensions with especially city governments. I understand that the Airbnb has a new way of approaching this, uh, your your relationship with city governments in particular. Can you tell us about that? I mean, one of our one of our guiding principles is that we want to strengthen the communities that we serve. Now, I will say that I started this company with my two friends when I was 26 years old. I had one job before this, and you know, when I came to Silicon Valley, the culture of Silicon Valley was technology may have well been a dictionary definition and synonym for the word good. And if you were in the technology industry, you felt like you were making the world a better place. Well, one of the things that happened is our companies got so big that I think something that's occurred to the industry and all of us is that we have a greater responsibility for the activity happening on our platform. That the kind of culture of the web 1.0, that the internet's an immune system, and if you give the community tools to regulate themselves, is probably not enough. And that you actually have to take more responsibility for the activity happening in your platform. And so that's one of the things that we started doing a number of years ago. And to date, we have more than 400 partnerships with cities. And just to give you an example, we've collected more than two and a half billion dollars in hotel tax. But the problem is that we're in 100,000 cities and every city is a relationship. And it can be very difficult to have these relationships on a total one-off basis. And the other thing that's happening is in the pandemic, people aren't just traveling to 20 or 30 cities anymore because they're getting in cars and they're going to smaller communities nearby. And so what we want to do is we want to now be able to scale these relationships and allow thousands of cities to know the activity happening in Airbnb, get the information they need, be able to contact us, and be able to have basic compliance tools. And so what we're creating is this product that we call the City Portal. The City Portal is basically a one-stop shop 
for a city, a small town, or even a rural community to be able to partner with Airbnb. And you can sign up today if you're interested in getting Airbnb's data for free. Who's going to do that? Who's not going to do that? Who doesn't like putting their hand up? <laughs> Guys, I'm going to have to leave it there. If you're planning for the future, I'd love to be of service to you. For the rest of the day, I'm free of charge. Come and chat with me. Let's hear it for Craig Rispin. And please do take advantage. Um, Craig is very giving and he will just have so many different things to talk to you. Just as I'd mentioned before, outside there was a story of using um, the drone, uh, drone league to come out there and do things. He's just got a stack of incredible ideas. Again, could you please join me in putting our hands together? Beautiful thank you to Craig Risman. Excellent. I'm sure some of us are looking for our morning tea, and um, we've got that, and it's happening down there in the expo area, which this is actually sponsored by the Visit Pacific Coast, um, that whole trade area. So let's give them a round of applause for putting on our coffee and teas. And what's happening, we need to be back here at 11.10 prompt, so aim for 5 past 11. And what you're going to do, take your bags, because it's going to be divided into three areas where we have our three streams. And then after that, um, we're going to go to lunch. And then at 1.45, the buses will be departing out the reception area, taking you to your field trips. They will return and bring you back at 5 p.m., which will leave you with 60 minutes to get all zhushed up for our wild night out. Um, there'll be some short drinks from 6 to 6.20 and then at 6.30 promptly we'll be then taking the buses out to the winding for those um, that are involved in that one. Make sure you do bring something warm. I think we were talking about wind earlier on um, and you must have your actual um, uh, uh, lanyard with you as well otherwise um, door bitch Nils will stop you from getting in there. Enjoy your morning tea, work your conversations, speak to Craig and we'll see you back up here at um, 10 past 11.
So true, funny how it seems, always in time, but never in line for dreams. Head over heels when told to toe. This is the sound of my soul. This is the sound. Yes. I bought a ticket to the world But now I've come back again Right, how oh, cool I find it hard <laughs> to write the next line I want the truth to be said Just begun listening to Ella all night long. This is the sound. Always slipping from my hands, sands of time of its own. I find it hard to write the next line. I want the truth to be known. I know this much. ticket to the world but now I've come back again finding it hard 
to write the next line I want the truth to be said I know this much I know this much is this much is true
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, plan B. Let me think about it. Hello, Jody. Okay. Um, I just I happened to print it off the hard copy of the speech inside the note. I'll, I'll just wing it. Yes. central to everything we do. Just yell out if you want something from me. I'm going to just practice. That's why we built an online, online travel market. Yes. I've seen, um, sorry to interrupt, I've seen Peter and we're on the same page. And we know what we're doing for this.
day is going to be the day that they're going to throw it back to you. By now, you should have somehow realized what you got to do. I don't believe that anybody feels the way I do about you now. And all the roads we have to walk are winding. And all the lights that lead us there are blinding. And there are many things that I'd like to say to you. I don't know how. Back feet, the word is on the street that the fire in your heart is out. And I'm sure you heard it all before, but you never really had any doubt. I don't believe anybody about you now And all the roads we have to walk are winding And all the lights that lead us there are blinding And there are many things that I'd like to say to you I don't know how I don't know how You're gonna be the one that saves me And after all You're my wonder wall
Yeah, okay. Two, two, two. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name's Elliot Daniel, uh, and now begins Stream B, Part 1, where our topic is agritourism development. Now, if you're in the wrong room, that's fine. This will be the best talk all day, so stay here. I'm going to talk briefly about my business, Visit Pacific Coast, and this is it. Our goal is to deliver visitor services differently, where the visitor is central to everything we do, aka citizen. Because tomorrow's visitors are tech savvy and connected digitally, want to be collaborated with, not lectured to, they don't want to follow the masses, they do want businesses to decouple from finite, finite resources, and they advocate for a decentralised financial system and by non-fungible tokens. And I'll answer what one of those is later if anyone wants to know. That's why we've built an all-in-one online travel marketplace, delivered to the palm of visitors' hands. Travellers can wake up in the morning and do whatever and go wherever they want to, all driven digitally and booked instantly from their mobile devices. What's exciting for you, the industry, is to be able to deliver real-time data of how visitors move and spend in destination within your LGAs. Thanks to our partnership with ATDW and TXA, we offer operators the ability to bring new and unique packaged products to market with no messy back end and book bookings that are in real time and direct. They can also now leverage off major events that you, the councils, bring to work so hard to bring to town. We're delivering aggressive and disruptive digital campaigns like Bring Your Budgies to drive leads to tourism practitioners, supported by quantifiable data. With my background as an ex-professional travel photojournalist and filmmaker, we're not just copy and pasting content, but delivering unique and researched travel narratives to become a trusted brand. What's the future hold for us? We've been focused on onboarding operators and connecting with the industry and if we've missed you I apologise. We'd love to talk to you and if we haven't met you please don't be shy, come and say good day, and reach out to us. Coming up are improvements to the user experience of the platform, in particular an old school meets new concierge model and modernising the payment gateway to emulate the retail shopping industry. In particular, we'd like to be, offer, be able to offer travel to be bought and sold using cryptocurrency. I did say to the Minister yesterday in a meeting, please don't do a China and shut it down on us, please. Unlike foreign-owned OTAs like Booking.com that leak taxes and jobs and charge exorbitant commissions, Visit Pacific Coast is an all Aussie company that is transparent we charge a flat 10% commission, including GST, and ensure dollars, taxes and jobs stay here in Australia. We want Visit Pacific Coast to be your council's choice as a conversion and marketing partner for the visitor of the future. Our digital platform is guiding visitors to journey to outstanding agritourism businesses like the Farm and Husk Distillery and the excellent local business Ricardo's Tomatoes and Strawberries Farm 
here in Port Macquarie. In order to change tack a bit and set us up for our scintillating agritourism panel discussion, I'd like to pose a few questions to you, the audience, to get your cognitive functions cranking and nerve synapses firing to the questions. If we add less than 1% of seaweed to ruminants' diets, we can reduce methane emissions by up to 80%. Now, this is important as livestock are responsible for 60% of Australia's agricultural carbon emissions, or roughly 10% overall. True or false? Bravo. Well done, audience. Question number two. Can a restaurant be an agritourism business? And if so, what are the conditions? Hold that, because someone's going to answer that, coming right up. And now, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to introduce our speakers. We have three wonderful ladies joining us today. We have Nikki Robinson, Ali Dench, and Coralie Bell. Would you like to come up, Nikki, and I can talk about you as you're walking up and give you a dramatic entrance? Nikki managed the Liverpool Plains Visitor Information Centre for nearly eight years until recently. And in this, take a seat if you'd like. And in this role, she was involved in this agritourism pilot program that we're going to hear about today that was initiated by the Office of the Small Business Commissioner. She now works as the team leader for Gunnedah Shire Council. I'm not going to hold that against you because we played Gunnedah in a trial rugby match in Coffs Harbour. They're hard, hard men. <laughs> Ellie Dench, ladies and gentlemen, thank you Ellie, is Executive Director, Community and Corporate at Wallandilly Shire Council and part of her portfolio is the oversight of the tourism and business investment sections of council. She is passionate about investing in innovation and increasing the economic and environmental outcomes of Wallandilly's primary industries, particularly agritourism opportunities. Lucky last is Coralie Bell. She's the chairperson of Art, or Australian Regional Tourism. And she brings a fresh perspective to tourism, and I can vouch for that. I met Coralie last night. That's 100% correct. She's a business and creative marketing professional with a diverse career of over 20 years in and around tourism. Please welcome our wonderful speakers this morning. <laughs> Coralie, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. I've got a few things. Hello. Um, it's so good to have so many um, familiar faces and all in one room in 3D. It's so exciting to me as a people person. You can't read a screen just the same. Um, okay, so today we've got, they've shut, cut us a little bit short because we're trying to get out on time with the running late. So we've got just under an hour. We're going to start with, sorry, <laughs> can't quite see over. <laughs> We're going to start with a bit of a national overview of agritourism, which for those of you who are involved with ART you may have seen before, but I only indulge me for five or so minutes. For those of you who haven't, I can give you a background into what ART has been doing in that space. And then we're going to come down and talk about what a pilot, an important pilot program for New South Wales, and these ladies are going to talk about what's happened in their respective local government areas and their experience in that. Um, and then we're just going to have a conversation about Let's get real about what we can do to drive change. So um, hopefully by the end of this, you've got some really tangible things to go back to your local government with. Um, and if you don't, feel free to stick, it's a conversation. So stick your hand up, um, challenge what we're saying to you and let's, let's um, we're sort of, I'm sick of talking about the pie in the sky now. Let's actually see some action. So I have a clicker, I believe. Um, okay, so just broadly speaking, Australian Regional Tourism, I'm the chair. I've been, I've lost count, must be four years or so. And what we do is we're an industry and government organisation that have a membership base. We're a not-for-profit and uh, where we lie differently to business chambers um, is that we specifically focus on regional tourism priorities. So our membership is, we've got members that are Tourism Australia, all of your state organisations are memberships of us, a lot of local governments are too, but we also have industry. And all we talk about really is regional tourism, um, which has had a lot of success in the last little while, so yay for us. Um, this is some, some interesting research that a lot of people don't really know from the agritourism space. It's an emerging sector. It's something five years ago we were trying to explain what it was. People hadn't really heard of it. And I guess for the purpose of this conversation and the answer to your question about is a restaurant an agritourism business, what we're talking about today is where agriculture and tourism as a sector meet in the middle. So yes, it could be 
that a restaurant is, but only where it highlights that agricultural sector. So I know we could debate that topic for four hours today, but if we can all come from that general understanding, it is already a $10 billion international market in Australia now. Five years ago, no one knew what it was, but that's our quantifiable data. And at the moment, about $6 billion domestically. Um, and in recent ART surveys, 84% of the councils who participated listed it in the top five growth areas. So this isn't just a concept we're talking about anymore, and wouldn't it be great if people could go onto a farm? This is real, and it's happening. <laughs> Thanks to the partnership with a lot of you guys. So it's like I kind of have to do a bit of a happy dance about that, because when I stood up years ago, everyone was like, what? What is agritourism? Now, just to, over to go back over what I'm sure I'm, I'm preaching to the converted here, no, but for those of you who are not familiar with the sector, income diversification for farmers, job creations for families and communities. Um, but really, when we're talking about big multi-million dollar farms, it's not always about the income. There's a really important part to regional communities that is pride of place, um, connection to where we live and the ability to tell stories to the city. And that's, we can't undervalue the importance of that for um, community wellbeing and mental health. Uh, there's also broader flow on effects to trade, for example. Uh, here's a case study, I won't go, I'm going to skip this one a bit because I'll let these ladies talk about their case studies. Um, but ART in the last few years have done quite a few research projects and discussion papers around the barriers to uh, agritourism. And I think there's several, and this is how we would summarise the top half a dozen. There's a general, has been a general lack of understanding of what is agritourism. Someone quite honestly asked me the other day, I want to do motocross on my farm. That's agritourism, right? <laughs> um, when we go out and talk to farmers in big regional areas that have suffered from drought or financial hardship, a common conversation I have with farmers is, no one wants to know what I do. Or I don't have time to go and put a suit on to have the visitors come to then go back and milk the cows. So there's a general nobody's interested in what I do feeling and a lack of knowledge in that sector because farmers are farmers. And there's a, tourism is tourism, it's a very different skill set. We've got a lack of infrastructure investment. I don't know if I had a dollar for every old farm that had an old house that no one had lived in for 100 years. Um, and that no news to anyone here in the room, but local government and local land use planning um, and a myriad of regulation around farming has been a consistent barrier when people start to change. Um, and, and every farmer that I've spoken to brings up biosecurity in some way or another, biosecurity and insurance. So how can councils facilitate agritourism development and we'll, this is broadly speaking but we'll certainly get a lot more tangible as we keep going. But we can partner with other councils and this speaks to what the Minister spoke about this morning. Uh, visitors and business don't see our borders. We can educate farmers and sometimes that's just starting the conversation. There's a lot of different support we can do to farmers in getting them from farm to agritourism business and we can handhold along the way and concierge. We can consider giving feedback to when there's land use reforms um, to try and advocate for change and we can stay up to date with ART. Quick plug there, don't forget to pay your membership. <laughs> um, what ART's been doing in a very large way is bringing together federal and state governments to partner with the agricultural industry. Um, and part of what my role is is really to have conversations and to ask hard questions, um, but not necessarily to have the answers, to bring together the right people to come up with the answers. Um, we're also looking at different uh, training programs, so there's some information about that if we, I can, happy to talk to you about it a bit more. We've got some really hands-on resources that anyone who is here can get from the hub. We've got a free online resource you can log into. We've got the Australian Regional Tourism uh, boosting Regional Australia through Agritourism Discussion Paper. It's been out for a couple of years, so a lot of you might have seen it, but if you haven't, it's worth reading. There's also, we worked with Airbnb to bring out a handbook on the great Aussie farm stay and how farmers can create that tourism experience. And we're also working fairly regularly with the STO, so that's Destination New South Wales, as well as all the others around the country on how we can advocate for change. Um, and Lauren, my lovely Lauren, who is... Um, who is our EO, will never let me miss an opportunity to remind you how to log into the hub. So she's whacked that on at the end. So thanks, Lauren. <laughs> 
Um, but if you haven't seen the Hub log on, there's a lot of resources available. So from here, I'm going to pass on um, to the lovely ladies to my <laughs> left. We've got um, Wall and Dilly Shire going to talk about the state government, um, New South Wales, collectively has taken really by the horns in a, a lot of ways the conversations about agritourism um, and led, led reform in different ways to the rest of the country. And that's why we've, we're having this conversation today. Yeah, go. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, look, you're right, and I, I stand corrected. So did everyone hear that? I think absolutely businesses have been doing it for a long time, but as a sector, we haven't recognised what that is. And there's a growing demand from the visitor to want it. Um, and so collectively, we haven't labelled it before, I guess. But there's not to say that there's been hero businesses in that, in that sector for a very long time. Um, so if I'll, I'll hand over to Wall and Dilly um, to have a chat, and then we'll move, we'll keep going. Go for it. I like a challenge. We haven't got through. Go. Karen Hatchinson, Mid Coast Council. I am a farmer. Yep. Um, and there is a lot of agribusiness in the ground. Yeah. Uh, illegally. Yes. That's, that's, that's what I want to have a talk about. Goes, that's yep. what I'm talking about. We're only just looking at our LEP now. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Exactly right. So that brings me well, halfway through my sentence. So <laughs> you look, I lost my train of thought. So New South Wales, one of the things New South Wales has done is they asked the Small Business Commission to do a review into all of the different red tape and they partnered with four or five different local government areas to concierge businesses through the process of becoming a legal agritourism business. And both of these local government areas you've got here were part of that pilot. So what we want to talk about is what their experience was, what they've learned, and then we'll, we'll have, let's have a frank and fearless conversation about it. Good, thank you. <laughs> that's just wonderful, because that's exactly what I want to talk about today, because I'm actually traumatised, to, uh, to be honest with you, <laughs> over the um, program that we went through. And so a couple of my colleagues a little bit traumatised over it um, in regards to setting up expectations for it to then all fall apart. So that's when I have a chat today. So Wallandilly Shire, we're the Shire beside the one you're thinking of. No, we're not Windsor Caribbee. Um, we are the gateway to the Southern Highlands. Um, and we are one of the eight councils in what's called the Western Sydney City Deal. Um, and that's the Western Parkland City, which is part of the three metropolitan cities of the um, metropolitan planning strategy for the New South Wales State Government. And um, we actually were the lead council on the agritourism um, and agribusiness commitment in the Western Sydney City Dale because the Nancy Bird, the bird's going to be here very soon, and that's the Western Sydney Airport, which is only 11 kilometres away from the top of our shire um, in Badgerys Creek. But yet when it comes to connectivity and being able to get there, we've got one little crossing called the Blacksland Crossing um, to get up to the airport. And everything was all being all planned on the eastern side of the airport. So to get from Wallandilly, which we're only 11 kilometres away up in the north, to the airport, we have to go all the way around through Camden, up through Ludnam and around Bingelli, all the way up to the northern gate. So, and for us to get any benefit from a tourism opportunities, particularly uh, those coming into the bird when it's eventually built, um, we have to have better connectivity, otherwise we're just going to be missed and people will just jump straight onto a train or car up to the Blue Mountains or straight up to the central coast or straight down into where you think I am, where I'm not, Windsor Caribbee. So, um, and congratulations to Windsor Caribbee. They are absolutely, I think a round of applause, absolutely brilliant getting the um, Tourism Town Award. I think that was just fantastic. So this is a photograph of Montpellier Drive, which is up in the, um, around the mid part of our shire. 
We are um, 76 kilometres away from Sydney. Uh, we have a population of uh, 50 odd thousand people. And we are, our, our vision is rural living, but we're one of the fastest growing areas where we have a, a growth area called Wilton, which is, I'm not sure if you've ever traveled down along the, the freeway where everyone jumps out of airplanes and does skydiving, that's in the Wallandilly Shire. That's the interchange where Wilton is being developed. There's going to be 15,000 new homes there, 50,000 people. Not only that, there is the Greater Macarthur area growth area, which is in Appen, which is part of Wallandilly. Um, where there's going to be possibly another 50,000. So we're going to triple in size of population in the next 20 years, 15. Or the tsunami, actually I'm on the surfboard at the moment and the tsunami's at the top of me. So when it comes to the way that we're growing and the rate of growth. So when this program came along, we jumped at the opportunity to be involved because we want to develop more jobs in the Shire, we want to develop more uh, visitation in the Shire. So the program was all about investigating options to develop um, business beyond the farm gate. And we have quite a few farmers in our area, but because of the growth, it's a lot easier to hold on to your land for subdivision and development than it is for farming. So we wanted to encourage and keep um, our agriculture in our shire. We're one of the peri-urban councils and once the concrete goes over, there is no way where we can farm and actually produce food. And that's the one thing that's going to create a really good resilient city of Sydney is to ensure that we have agriculture um, within the Greater Sydney area and it's starting to disappear. So this we saw as another way in which to try and diversify our farmers' opportunities for income um, and looking at how they can, can uh, uh, develop connections and explore opportunities around diversifying their business rather than land banking and hoping a developer come along and, and, and cut it up. But our strategic plan is no, we want to keep our rural views and vistas and agriculture in the Shire. So the, as, as Coralie said, this program was facilitated actually through a, a, a Rose White from Regionality. Uh, we were in partnership with Rose um, and with the Small Business, New South Wales Small Business Commission. And it was focused on a business development program. And it involved three phases, which was pilot and discovery, regulatory reform and capacity building, and implementation and evaluation. And so the phase one is what we were involved in and we developed a agritourism field day where we ran a couple of workshops with Rose um, and it was designed to help agricultural businesses develop their ideas and knowledge and we had 24 um, local rural landholders who were um, really excited and interested about this and we developed an environment in which for everyone to collaborate because that's what it was about. Not one of us is able to deliver the whole tourism economy <laughs> across Wallandilly, so let's get together and collaborate, exactly what the Minister was saying. Um, and, it, and it was about making sure we can explore to what our differences were, what our points of difference were, uh, so as we could diversify and attract a visitation. So, and so local government is seen as the closest form of government, of course, to our community and understanding our operators. And we wanted to enable an environment for um, for um, our, um, our farmers. So it was about mapping, and we were mapping the current customer journey and identifying what were the pain points. And so this was, was the outcome where we discovered what those particular pain points were, which actually is what left us a little bit scarred, because we set up so much expectation. We said we could do this. We could help you diversify and develop to only then run into a steam train. <laughs> because we've got steam trains in Thorme. Um, we don't have an electrified line out our way. I'll just throw that in, which makes it even difficult for um, visitors to, to arrive. But it, it was the fact that the pain points was a lot of stuff we wanted to do, what you said, not permissible within the land zoning. Um, so our LEP uh, is what was holding everybody back from being able to do this legally. 
and for us to be able to, to help and support. So, and also too, we found um, through talking through things, it was the issues around the uh, development application process, even if it was permissible, was in itself a struggle. And a lot of red tape, uh, the cost, the length of time, the communication process, people not understanding each other. We've got planning speak, we've got community speak, we've got tourism speak, we've got all different speak, and everything's all got definitions. Uh, and it just become all too much, all too much. So we had a lot of people walk away and a lot of frustrated people walking away and all of a sudden, council, you're bloody hopeless. Council, you're useless. Not understanding a lot of it is state legislation, not local legislation. And we became the meat in the sandwich. One minute, cool. Oh, cool. One minute. <laughs> so much I want to say. Um, the infrastructure and expectations, we have people wanting to set up, um, like food experiences as part of their produce from their farm. But next thing they know, they had to have a car park that had to be sealed, they had to have curb and guttering, they had to have uh, toilets that were accessible, we had to make sure that all the fire safety, we're in a bushfire zone, heavily impacted by the Green Model Fire. Yes, the farm with trees. Uh, if you're doing biobanking, you've got a lot of trees. <laughs> so it, it, it certainly became um, a, a really big issue. So what have we done? What we did is, it was an opportunity for us, and COVID has been an opportunity, and it's an opportunity we all need to continue to grab and do, and that is take this downtime, or if you want to call it downtime, because we're busy trying to get everyone online and working from home and, and everything else. But anyway, we'll work through it. How can we how can we streamline our red tapes? So we've got a wonderful planning unit who grabbed the bull by the horns, listened to what was said at these workshops, and developed a planning proposal to try and amend the early to do that. So um, with, the, with the local environment plan, we, it's called a stage 1A planning proposal because we had a planning proposal already in place. That's a whole other story. Um, so this was the 1A part of it. So the, um, the, the objectives in the planning proposal was to increase opportunity for events, enable um, wedding, destination weddings functions, ensure that the um, most up-to-date model and provisions and development in terms with the standard instrument were in place, enable more diverse tourism accommodation, and minimise or avoid the impact of bushfire hazard. So as a result, we're also developing, we're looking at developing a DA template um, to assist uh, farmers, so as you don't have to go off and get your own planning consultant and, and what have you. We have changed the model of our structure at Council, where we are now, we have changed, we're now getting a business concierge and um, a business investment concierge, an executive planner, a development information planner who can actually give that information over the counter now directly to the public. Um, we're developing and, and updating our events guide to make sure it's relevant to, to how we are delivering events in the rural area. We are also um, aligning um, our tourism team with our communication events and engagement team so we can develop a better customer experience is what, 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 what we're doing. But um, yeah, 10 seconds. Toolkit to assist businesses in recovery is another thing. <laughs> Maybe some of this might come out of questions. but. It takes time. <laughs> state planning controls are a pain in the butt. State planning controls is what we are trying to navigate at the moment to try and influence and make change, and that's what we can do by advocating. And we're going to we're going to continue to do this. We're going to continue to um, to actively advocate for the amendments of the LEP and state planning controls to support our rural economy, to enable these sorts of things to happen, so as we don't continue getting grey hair. Like I have. Cool. Now, just while while our next speaker gets up, Elizabeth in the room. I challenge you all to go ask Elizabeth when they did the state planning reform with DPI, and she had to collate all the local government feedback. How many tourism tourism local government people got back to her for the whole state? Do you think? Two of you. The rest of it was planners. And so the local government New South Wales response is a planning response to that level. Sorry. Over to you. 
I'm Nikki Robertson from the Gunnard Shire Council. I've worked for Liverpool Plain Shire Council, which was involved in the tourism in the agritourism pilot previously. Thank you for letting me inviting me to share our agritourism wisdom with you here today. The Liverpool Plains has branded their tourism with sunflowers when I started working as a tourism manager and it is also the closest town, uh, the closest area with um, broad acre farming to Sydney. And pretty early on I noticed how much of a draw cut the sunflowers were to get Sydney people out of the country, out of the city, to come to the country. I've also realised what a volatile attraction it is because the sunflowers don't grow at the same place at the same time every year. So it was very difficult to get that information across to the visitors. I'll get to that a bit later. Now agriculture is the main industry in the Liverpool Plains and tourism used to be a minor player. At the visitor information centre locals would come in and look around and go, wow, what a visitor information centre. Why would anyone come to Willow Tree? Why? What would they see here? And that was the attitude. So farming was our industry, tourism didn't know what to do with it. And then came the drought. So in the drought really shone a spotlight on agriculture on regional Australia. People from the city want to come out and spend money in the regional areas and supporting us. They also want to know the, the plight of the farmers. The farmers also saw tourism as an alternative income. And they also realised that having visitors on their farm also helped their mental health because they were very isolated during the drought. And visitors coming in, talking to them, tagging along all day was sometimes the saviour of a farmer's life. But where to start? Nobody knew where to start, neither the tourism office or the farmers or the councils. So when the office of the Small Business Commissioner came along and offered us a spot in the pilot, the Liverpool Plain Shire Council jumped on it. So we also recruited some farmers. We had a group of 10 farmers who were interested in venturing out into agritourism. And they did this workshop series with Rose Wright from Regionality. They learned about business planning, about tourism, about biosecurity, dealing with councils and marketing. So the whole package, it was very interesting and a great eye opener to all of them. The farms that were involved were cropping, cattle, we have farms that have accommodation on their place, be it um, old um, renovated shearing quarters or uh, cabins. We have a lavender farm and we have a farm that um, sells beef directly from their farm. Then we've got others that offer um, workshops which, can, which are um, in education or art. So the, at the end of the workshop, these farmers were very motivated and they formed the Plains Inc. So the Plains Inc in the Liverpool Plains is now the agriculture driver for the area. They are currently working on their branding and then they want to start farm trails, they want to organise events, and they also want to open up to farms in the surrounding areas because, as we heard several times today, visitors don't care what LGA they're in. So other farms in Tamworth, Upper Hunter and Gunnada can join the Plains Inc and they can support each other, promote each other and help each other in agritourism. So the Plains Inc has, have also reviewed the development in, in uh, the proposed development planning changes and I've spoken to both the Liverpool Plains and Gunnada Shire planners and they all agree that the changes are going to simplify the process for farmers to venture into agritourism. If there was an opt-in opt opportunity for councils, Gunnada Shire Council would certainly look into it and support facilitating agritourism. What's my function in all of this? So I'm the tourism team leader in Canada. My function is to link 
the tourists to the farmers and the farmers to the tourists. Because if you come out to Ganara, you see all these wonderful crops, but where's the farmer? So you need that contact. I can also help the farmers to promote their business, educate the visitors about agriculture and biosecurity, protect the farmer from mass tourism, to ensure that tourism has a positive impact on the farm business, because the farmers are farmers in the first place. We can, I can help organise events, itineraries, linking them, the farmers, with regional and state tourism bodies, helping with grants and funding opportunities, and business development. So the agritourism pilot has helped councils understand agritourism, the needs and hurdles to overcome, to protect both the farmer and the visitors, and has created the link between the farmers and the local government tourism drivers. We are only at the beginning, but it is a very exciting um, industry to tap into. Agritourism has a lot to offer. If you're interested in connecting to the Plains Inc. or to myself, you can do so via the Canada Visitor Information Centre or um, via LinkedIn. Thank you. Are we being told to wrap it up? I've just been given the nod. I apologise because um, there's obviously a lot of interest and I can, I'm sensing that people want to have questions. I apologise. I don't think we can. Let's have some questions. Let's go. I know there's got to be a whole lot out there, yeah. Do we have a microphone to send around the room? Thank you kindly. That's so yes, lovely of you. Thank you yeah, very I'm much. Back up. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Hi, I'm Charlotte Well, DPI have just done a review of the, a lot of the local government planning and all of the local governments were asked to give collective feedback. I encourage you to have a chat to, I see you there, um, have a chat to Elizabeth about that response. I think um, what you'll find is a lot of the planners made that response and didn't necessarily speak to a lot of the tourism managers. So what I would really encourage you to do is to go and sit down and have a chat to your planners um, and make sure that they're hearing two sides of the story because that's happening now. couple up the back with burning points. Bushfire, yeah. Continue. At the moment, the challenge we have is rules are different between each local government area. And collectively, local governments often advocate for that to stay the same because we like to have control of what happens in our own backyard. So that's a challenge we all need to, 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 to talk about. Either we give up the power or we work individually. Hi, Paul, Paul Moody, Port Service Council. Um, I'm surprised that nobody's mentioned what I consider to be the biggest thing happening in agro um, uh, tourism at the moment. That's it. 
Uh, hip, yeah. Sorry, you just told you Hip camp, camp. wiki camps. And that's hip camp. Yep. Now, hip camp is just like Airbnb, but for people who want to have camping on farms, and it's totally unregulated, and it's really starting to uh, get traction. It's happening everywhere. Mm. And, um, you know, I suppose it hasn't been mentioned, and I was wondering why, that's my actual question, but I'll give you an example. About 12 months ago, a lady came to me, and she, she said she wanted to uh, enable camping on her rural property. It's only about 10 acres. And she said, um, you know, she'd like to put a DA in, and she didn't know what to do, and I explained it to her, and she said, no, oh, that all seems a bit more difficult than what I thought. And anyway, she reluctantly said, that's what I'll do. Uh, then she came back and she said, what about this hip camp? And I said, well, look, that's unregulated. I wouldn't do that, you know, for insurance purposes. It would be best to get a free blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so she agreed to put it in the DA. Well, we're now sitting um, probably well over 12 months since that DA was lodged. She still doesn't have approval. And in the meantime, 50 farms within 30 kilometres around it are now on hip camp. So what is this organisation? organisation's view yep. on hip camp and what should councils do about it? Well, look, from an from an ART point of view, there's two sides of that conversation. There's consumer demand and, you know, opening up planning reform to allow people to have DAs approved is what we would advocate for. Um, from a I work for a local government on the New South Wales South Coast, so full disclosure there. From a local government point of view, we have liability if in a flood zone. If I know there's camping in a flood zone and I haven't acted to stop that camp, um, then if there's a flood and someone dies, council has real liability for that. So I think it's complicated. Um, but really, from a national point of view, we should be advocating for that platform to have some level of regulation. Did you want to say the lucky last one? Two last ones. Okay. We'll go here on the right and then to you. Yep, great. Thank you. Um, yeah. I'm um, Jenny Aitchison, Shadow Minister for Tourism in New South Wales and also for uh, Primary Industry. So, very interesting uh, topic. But two issues that I think councils need to talk about too is resilience. So, last year with the bushfires, uh, a lot of people who were trying to diversify their agriculture and had gone into uh, tourism then found that they slipped completely between the cracks of rural um, assistance from the RAA after the fires and we have to address this because it's no good telling farmers to diversify your business if then when there's a natural disaster you actually have nothing which is and I saw this with my own eyes. The other issue is the mouse play. Um, I've been talking about this quite a lot lately but it's six to eight months this has been going on. The government promised 50 million dollars for that uh, two weeks ago. It was supposed to be rolling out now. We're now hearing bait stations won't be there till August and even Service New South Wales aren't paying people for the baits that they promised they were reimbursing until early July if not fly, which I know is coming up in a couple of weeks before you can get it after that. So that is, I am really concerned about what the mouse plague will be doing to tourism uh, in these regional areas. And the golden epoch we're in now is a really big problem. I've had calls from the BBC. I've seen articles in the Washington Post. Luckily, we don't have inbound tourism at the moment but it is stopping tourism. So there are two things yeah. you should all be talking to the government about from your position as local government councillors. Um, Thank you. Last question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Got a loud voice, come Sorry. on. <laughs> Hi, Rebecca Johnson from Kibon Council. I have a, a question, I guess, about uh, how you best manage community expectations within your own LGA when it comes to agritourism, appreciating that not all of agriculture is very sexy, and I'm thinking about vulnerability particularly with the uh, huge number of chicken farms that you've got in your area, and they're a little bit woofy and not beautiful to look at. Okay. How do you best, <laughs> <laughs> how do you best I, I guess, the that. farmers, yeah. the legitimate farmers on site, and balance the, that with the well, this is this, this is all about agritourism. It's not just about the sites, it's about the smells. <laughs> it's about the infrastructure. It's about the experience. Coming out and having a you're going to have poultry smells, you're going to have cow smells, you're going to have cow sounds, um, those sorts of things. So it's, it's all about that experience and, so, and, and trying to, to make compatible land uses. That, that's nonsensical. They aren't compatible. You've just got to look at the opportunities within that and then how you promote it, how you, um, the narrative around it and the story. People are wanting these experiences. Get your gumboots on and come on out and jump in the cow paddies and see what it's like. Um, it, it's, 
What a beautiful way to... Sorry. No, that's a perfect <laughs> statement. What a beautiful end. Yeah. Sorry, I, I can talk all day. Thank you for me up and we've got to keep moving. Thank you very much, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. Please thank our wonderful panel, the ladies. Ali, Nikki and Coralie, we've got some presents. A um, bit of housekeeping. Next is part two of Stream B, which is in room four. Um, there's another stream in here, so just make sure you're in the right spot. Thank you very much. Can I um, grab a bottle of water? We've got some yes. presents, ladies. Mm -hmm. Take it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, that's totally honest. Thank you so much. Thank you. The juice is going. Lovely. Thank you. Really well done. <laughs> Hello, hello. Yes. Right. You're a champ. What book of us? Do you know? Sounds terrible, but uh, Julia and Catherine here. <laughs> That's all right. I just had to 
find out who the people I'm going to be introducing. <laughs> no, no, that's, I just wanted to make sure you're here because we haven't had a chance because we got thrown out of the other room, for, which a lot of people were at. And you know what? If we have a good session in here, we might throw to Richard at the end for a little bit more because um, it's sort of all festivals and events. So it does look like we're pretty much here. Um, quite a few of you people were in the first stream and to make sure we don't get cut short again I'm not really going to do much of an introduction um, and we'll give that time to speakers. Um, so my name is Kevin Williams and I'm the Executive Director of Arts Mid North Coast and as I say we're delighted to be sponsoring this stream and the proceedings today. Um, we acknowledge that probably this is the first time that arts and culture has been featured at a local government conference, so they're to be congratulated uh, on that. Arts Mid North Coast would respectfully acknowledge and upholds the special relationship of the local Burrapai people from this region to their land and their waterways. We pay our respect to their elders past, present and emerging, and any of those who may be present today. Very quickly, just so you know where I'm from, Arts Mid North Coast is an incorporated society that has six representatives from the six councils in our region, plus six artists drawn from the community and uh, areas of skill. Um, our role primarily is to keep the arts and artists at the forefront of discussions. Oh, I see one of my board members there. Um, <laughs> at, at the forefront of uh, discussions and strategic planning for the region, because it's only a little thing in the region and could get a bit lost if we don't make a lot of noise. Um, so our region covers Mid Coast Council, Port Macquarie, Hastings Council, Kempsey, Nambucca, Ballingen and Coffs Harbour. So we have a total population of 325,000, so it's quite a, a large population. Um, you know, it's the equivalent of a large city, really. Um, and I often say that because we're larger than two state capitals, or territory capitals, uh, and we're larger in area than countries such as Slovenia and Israel, it would be nice to have the equivalent resources, but that's not to be the case. So I've got one board member here, and I have my other 0.8 of a staff member here, and that's us, basically. Um, so there are 13 other rados throughout Regional Arts New South Wales, and I know by looking at the registration list that there are quite a few uh, metropolitan people here in this session, so you may not know about the RADO network. So basically, uh, most of regional New South Wales, and there are some exceptions, but that may change shortly um, from decisions of the Minister, uh, have a, a RADO organisation. Um, and we do things both collaborative, collaboratively, we're just doing a strategic uh, project on art and the environment uh, over the next couple of years, and we've also got a common landing page now for all our cultural experiences uh, under the banner for cultural tourism. Um, obviously, I'm going to keep it short now because um, you know, we do do a lot of work in cultural tourism, so come and see us on Stand 11. We've got lots of goodies to give you, and we can talk about that in more detail rather than take up the time of the speakers here today. Uh, as people are filtering in, um, clearly on the mid-north coast for our region, tourism is a big economic driver, and that has influenced the amount of work that we've done in the cultural tourism field. Um, and festivals are a very important part of that. So we have a number of major festivals in the region, some of which have been going, Camp Creative's probably been going 30, 35 years. Um, uh, there are a number of others that have been going 15, 20 years. So with those ones, our role is mainly helping in things like succession planning, because that's the reason sometimes that most of the festivals fall over, because the committees get um, tired of producing them. And in other areas, we're working with communities to develop new festivals. So at this time, with COVID, obviously festivals have been very hard hit, and most if not all last year were cancelled, but we are coming back now with uh, festivals in the last few months that have started and progressed. Um, so I think the session today is going to be in two parts. Um, we have Julia and Catherine here today who are going to be presenting in person. And then later on in the day, uh, well later on in the session, Francesca is going to be zooming in from Melbourne. Um, Oh, she's on the screen. 
Okay, I never look at the screen unless I'm sitting down there. <laughs> okay, well you knew all that, I didn't need to say that at all. Um, so I'll just get off the stage and hand over to Julia, who's General Manager of the Australian Festivals Association, and Catherine Holloway, who's uh, Secretary of the Australian Festivals Association, but also is General Manager of Cattle Yard, which has brought the uh, very interestingly named Grooving the Moo Festival to life, and we might talk a little bit about that later. So I'll hand it over. This tech here, is it okay if we use this microphone as well and yes. do a bit of a dual song and dance? Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'd just also like to acknowledge the Birupai people and um, pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I am a proud uh, Wiradjuri woman living on Wurundjeri lands. I have come all the way from Fitzroy North in Melbourne, but don't worry, I have been here for two weeks. <laughs> Safe. So, um, so please don't, you know, feel free to come and talk to me afterwards if you'd like. Um, so yeah, so my name's Julia Robinson. I'm the general manager of the Australian Festival Association, as it says up there. Um, I'll, we will actually be doing this conversation with all three of us at the same time. Um, uh, so Kat here, I mean, I, I don't know if you'd like to introduce sure. yourself as well. <laughs> uh, I'm Kat, no, still not on. We run festivals, we don't usually have to turn on the mics ourselves. Is that a bit better? There we are. So my name's Catherine Holloway. I'm the general manager of Groove and the Moo. Um, for those that don't know, briefly, Groove and the Moo started in the Hunter region. Gloucester was the first show in 2005. From there, it has travelled to all around Australia and we're now in six different states and territories. Um, I'm also on the board of the AFA and work with Julia and a group of other excellent people um, to hopefully support the Australian Festival Association pre-COVID and now we have a slightly different remit and challenge of getting through. Um, so thank you. And then Francesca, I think you should just jump in and, and give us a song and dance. I can't tell you how to be in my concert. I'm calling it territory in Victoria, which is right smack in the territory. My background is performance, arts and culture, and I've worked with Julia and her team the past months in events. Francesca, we might just get you to check your connection because that wasn't very strong, um, but we might keep going and um, we, m we actually uh, will speak to you mostly in the later part of this session anyway. So, Am I right to just skip ahead on this? Is that oh, great? So that was our introduction. Um, we'll just be taking you through kind of the brief, like what is a festival going back to basics, just to see where we're at in the room, who's actually, who goes to festivals, who needs to kind of get back to basics and, um, and look at the definition of what a festival is. Um, we'll take you through a bit of the COVID impact in some numbers, because we've got some pretty um, specific uh, ticket ticketing data numbers that we can take you through. Um, the current status and what's kind of on the minds of um, some of our members that we, we hear from on a day-to-day -day basis, sometimes a minute-by-minute -minute basis when I'm getting text messages about Melbourne at the moment. Um, the priorities for the AFA moving forward. And then we'll get into, um, we'll probably try and, you know, chat through that pretty quickly and then get into how we can reboot right um, and how councils can help. Okay, so um, just a real quick over overview of uh, the AFA for those um, who've, who've probably never heard of us because we're an industry body. So we, um, we were formed in 2018 to, sh to represent the shared needs of the festival industry. So back in 2018, we, have a different, we had a different crisis that we were dealing with in New South Wales in particular um, with some of the music festivals um, facing some, some issues around safety. There were some really tragic deaths um, at some music festivals which led to um, uh, a quick change of policy and procedure around licensing and around regulations for music festivals. There was no association that was formed to represent the, the needs and actually provide context around safety at music festivals and give that understanding of um, what that issue was, which was a real societal issue that was taking place at music festivals as opposed to a, an issue that music festivals were causing necessarily. 
Um, so we were formed, Kat, was, um, Kat and Groove and the Moo were one of the founding members, uh, as well as some of the other big names that you'd probably have heard of, so Splendour in the Grass and Falls Festival, so that's Secret Sounds, they're another founding board member, um, as well as Laneway Festival a lot of people uh, would know of. Um, some other festivals including Field Day, Harbour Life um, and Listen Out that happen in New South Wales. And then we had CMC Rocks Queensland. Um, and then from there we opened out our membership and now we include members such as um, Soul Traders, suppliers. So we've got Splashdown, everyone knows Kenny from Splashdown from the movies, but um, it's, it's actually Des from Splashdown. He started pretty soon um, into us uh, forming because New South Wales Health were asking questions around wastewater. Um, testing. So Des from Splashdown kind of wanted to know what his rights were. Um, we also have ticketing providers, so um, that they're interested in um, the ticketing implications. It's all a knock-on effect when a, when a festival is implicated um, in something and, and there's a, a downturn. Ticketing is implicated. Um, uh, furniture and infrastructure, so fencing providers, um, toilets, as I mentioned. Then some of the sole traders, so there's site managers who help build the stages, who help build the marquees. There's event managers who help run the shows, so it's, it's a knock-on effect there and all of those um, people came on board and they're all paying um, membership fees to help keep um, the company running and keep the association ticking along providing advocacy services. Um, so yeah and we've also got um, local government areas as well who are members so Tamworth Country Music Festival became a member so Tamworth Council. One of our board members now includes um, Di Snedden from Port Phillip Council down in Victoria that uh, look after like St Kilda Festival and events that take place there. So we, um, yeah, we're also here for venues and, and local government areas. So that's who we are. Um, I came on board um, from 2018 as well. I um, have a history with music festivals, so I've worked for 20 years in the industry, um, both at music festivals and music venues. Um, so I come from an industry perspective as opposed to an advocacy perspective um, and I've sort of had to learn that other part of the job along the way. But um, that in-depth kind of knowledge about our members, our venues, our sole, sole traders and suppliers has really been um, invaluable, especially as we head into COVID. So just to get a bit of a lay of the land, do I have to sort of spell out what a festival is? Where are we at? Like who, has anyone been to festivals? Not recently, obviously. Are we a festival going kind of crowd? Feel free to get involved. Yes, there's a hand, there's some nods. Um, one thing I find very interesting, we're doing a project at the moment with, um, with UTS actually about what is a festival because we don't have a literary, literary definition for universities say about what a festival is in an Australian context. It doesn't sort of exist as kind of a piecemeal approach to this. Um, it does change obviously with different sub-genres, so a music festival versus a community festival, etc. And something that we're doing is about understanding what a festival is to each person that we're kind of dealing with, each stakeholder. So we're doing some in-depth interviews. I myself um, personally think that a festival is a gathering of like-minded people. And I don't think it necessarily involves number of stages, number of days, um, number of venues, anything like that. I think it's a, a gathering of like-minded like people. But we definitely have um, members and, and people that we speak to that specifically want to say it's got to be this many people or it's got to be this many stages or it's got to be across this many venues. It's a wide range of, um, of things that it includes, but that's why we're doing the, the research piece to actually kind of get a, a nice solid definition. Um, I don't know if you've got a definition of a music, uh, of, a, of a festival or maybe of your festival, do you think? No, I think um, festivals are generally thought of for us and our company as a celebration. So as Julia said, it's not necessarily about number of stages, number of days. I think everybody can agree that a festival usually includes multi in some way, whether it's multi days, multi stages, multi groups of people and multi faceted experience. So it might be food, beverages and music or arts, community and culture. Um, and while it'd be nice to say it doesn't have to have a hard definition, I think part of the, the workings that we're finding with local government, with state government, um, because there are policy and planning around it, there is a bit of a need to provide some form of definition to help us as much as it is to help local government, state, federal um, and planning. So yeah, that's federal. Yeah, that's pretty much where that, that's why this conversation and the research around what is a festival is quite important. 
And so um, here's just a, a few stats that we do um, that we do know that do exist at the moment. So festivals are attended by 46% of all Australians aged over 15, so that's half of the population. One in four Australians attend um, music festivals, so I think that that is quite a big um, number. It, it was maybe bigger than I thought when I was first kind of looking into this research. Um, and I'll just self-edit, this is actually 57%, but 57% of people who visited a new city or town did so to attend a festival or cultural event. So I think that's really relevant to today uh, or to this conference broadly speaking, um, and it couldn't be more relevant moving forward in a COVID world. So um, it is a way that we can get people coming to new cities and towns where we're not going to Spain anytime soon as much as we'd all love to um, go travelling overseas. But I think this is a way that we can um, get people travelling within their own country and seeing new cities and towns, and clearly the stats do back that up. Um, so this is a pretty sad screen, but this is the the um, the fact of the matter. So this is New South Wales, and this is based on ticketed festivals. So in 2019, there was 634 million dollars um, of output, direct and um, direct and indirect output for festivals in New South Wales. 2020, it was 88 million. It's an 86 percent um, hit. Now it was. It was, we probably only got those 14% because it was, it was March. So we did get one of our busiest seasons almost out of the way with January, February and a bit of March happening. Um, but it's a, pretty, it's, a, it's a pretty grim number. It's, it's, not, it's probably not surprising, but um, to see it there in black and white and yellow is, um, is pretty sad. Um, and the full-time uh, equivalent employment is quite high. Um, it's uh, something to explain to kind of our industry is whilst maybe 2,129 doesn't seem like a lot of people, when you're talking about a festival, sometimes they're like they're only working for three days, four days, maybe five days at a time. So actually it's, a, it's a quite a large number um, for the New South Wales um, uh, market. And then, yeah, that dipped to 298 again, I think only because we got through January, February and March. Um, there's a bit more, there's a few more stats out there at the moment um, that, that that filtered down that also point to the losses. So APRA, RAR, sorry, APRA AMCOS, who do the licensing, as I'm sure that local government um, do have to deal with as well, and how much fun is that? Um, they uh, have a stat out at the moment about live being um, revenue for licensing revenue being at 4% for 2020. So they're only 4% of their regular licensing um, revenue. So again, it's, um, it's pretty stark, it's, it's pretty um, total, and it is not looking all that much better so far this year, um, but that will probably come out at the end of the year. Um, it's important to also note that the, these numbers don't include unticketed events, so it doesn't include your local kind of community events where you haven't done ticketing. That moving forward will change with COVID. I'm sure that you've all had to work through those issues in terms of QR codes and, and maybe ticketing events that you haven't had to ticket before. Um, and actually what that might do is a benefit to the industry. So the more data that we can capture, um, I think the more impact we'll be able to show. Um, being only showing ticketed impacts um, is quite limited and I'm sure that you will, uh, and actually I think Francesca will also talk about that a little bit later as well in terms of, um, in terms of council's involvement in this kind of data capture. Okay, so current status. I don't know if we want to. Do you want to take some take some load off here um, with business confidence? So these were these were the three sort of main headings of um, the current status, just to sort of give you a bit of an overall picture of where festivals are at broadly at the moment. Um, so business confidence is one of the first um, factors that has recently taken a dip. So Blues Fest was a bit of a line in the sand broadly for the industry, and that's national, even though it's a New South Wales only event. Blues Fest shocked everyone. Um, it shocked uh, suppliers, venues, um, promoters, the whole gamut um, that if that event could get cancelled 24 hours before the show, anyone could get cancelled. So I don't know from a Groove in the Move perspective if you have something to add um, from business confidence, it would be useful. Sure, I think um, with regards to business confidence festivals, it is about obviously the promoter is taking a lion's share of the risk to put on the show, but you've also got all the suppliers, the food vendors, um, the local community, the local council, the tourism operators, the food and beverage people, um, and they're getting up until the day before the festival. As everyone would know, there's a huge amount of sunk costs that go into that. Um, and what we're finding over the past 15 months or so, with each uh, cancellation, everything dips a lot lower 
in terms of confidence and it takes a little bit longer to get people back on board to coming even to work with you for the next show. Um, even being able to schedule the next show is a very uh, large process and you have to consider all the factors of these people have been you know, assuming they're getting money and financial income for this particular point in time. And in the case of this, before June 30, for something like Blues Fest. So with each cancellation, everyone's getting more and more risk averse. And being risk averse means people aren't going to be, feel confident, to, confident or comfortable to be able to do anything or support any events, no matter how much people might want to or try. They're just, there's a financial reality, there's an emotional reality, and it does keep dwindling. So it's not just something for promoters or the festivals, it is something that is affecting every part of business around, um, around a festival. Yeah, I think, um, I think that's really important. I think just understanding kind of as well with, the, with this type of um, planning structure and how project budgets work, it's not, um, it's, you know, before COVID we were 12 to 18 month planning structures and now we're working in a totally different um, environment where we've got less lead time but more risk um, and so business confidence is, is really low. It won't be all negative, I promise. We'll get to like the good stuff but we've got to, we're not going to end on this, we want to end on the nice stuff. So, but just to sort of give the lay of Yeah, it's probably worth <laughs> saying as well that everybody does want to be confident um, and the wonderful thing about the festival community is people do still want to be involved. Um, but the with the timeline shrinking, the cost and the output is still the same. Um, it's just the risk was already high, it's just now a lot higher. So so it's how we can all work together. What we, we talk about a lot is shared risk. We're, we're all sharing in the risk of putting on a festival um, and how we can best limit that risk and buffer it for the people who are participating. Yeah, that's right. Um, and I guess what, the, um, and just so you know, I kept this very, um, just three very sort of simple points because I can't even tell you how many times I could rewrite this each week with how quickly it shifts but because business confidence kind of at the beginning of the year was actually quite high things were different it was looking great we were looking like oh maybe we would have a few festivals happen in winter and then spring summer 22 uh, 21 22 was looking quite good um, but then everything changes the budget gets announced we're locking down until J July next year um, which really impacts on the rest of the way that um, festivals are usually put together. So it just changes so quickly. So I've just kept it like this so that I can give you the most up to date. Um, but just in terms of the, the risks and, and, and relating to Blues Fest and, and the business confidence, I, I know that there's been some numbers bandied around about the cost of putting on shows and, and, and the cost of um, different festivals that have had to cancel. But as a general rule, we work on a bit of a 70%. So 70% of costs are sunk at the time of gates open. So that can just give you an idea of what people are facing at that point. So rising, for example, um, down in Melbourne, I've lost Francesca from the screen, but Francesca was actually at the rising um, festival's first night, which was last night, and that the gates were open. It was obviously not a gated event. It was a, a broad, it's a, um, a broad city-wide event, if, for those of you who, who are not aware of rising. But at that point, all the marketing spend is done. All of the staff have been working. All of the shows are on. The artists are in town. The costs have been sunk and it's now locked down and they're not going to operate. So um, it's, you know, around that 70% is what we say. Um, the cost of putting on the show obviously moves moves wildly between different sizes of, um, of events, but it's a, it's a pretty significant portion of the um, expenditure. With consumer confidence, um, again, this has really changed very rapidly. Um, at, like in the last four to six weeks, it has changed and this sort of is happening live. So if you think again, it's good that we can use these New South Wales contexts, but if you think about someone who's got a ticket to Blues Fest and who's maybe got a ticket to Splendour in the Grass, they're sitting on $1,000 worth of tickets that are unrealised currently. Um, if they're 20, 23, 24, is there a likelihood of them putting out more money on tickets that are not potentially going to happen or may happen or may not happen? So that's, that's kind of a good example at the moment. Um, the other thing is Melbourne's just gone into lockdown. So that's like 
that's impacting consumer confidence as well. They're thinking, oh, well, if I buy a ticket to something regional or in another state, will it, will it come back on me? Um, the other thing is there's potentially a bit of fatigue with certain offerings that are out there at the moment. So if we're talking about a music context, there is just a certain number of Australian artists that are out there at the moment. Whether that's impacting it or not, you know, it's hard to pinpoint, but I think that there's just a multitude of factors. Um, we're not going to get internationals in very easily anytime soon and you know rightly so we should obviously politics aside but you know there's a lot of opinions about bringing home our residents first and whether you you move into the bringing in internationals before that that's another question but that's always impacting it as well so consumer confidence is complicated but it's it's changed again at the beginning of the year or sort of mid midway through the first quarter we were looking at a higher sort of confidence level with a low business confidence level as that was starting to dip and that's a weird space to be in. Now we're sort of a bit lower on both of them. It's a roller coaster. It's always changing. You had a, yeah. Yeah, I think it's also worth noting just with consumer confidence and the research that has been done on it by um, a number of the larger ticketing agencies as well, is it does suggest technically that consumer confidence is quite high, but it focuses on people's intention. So we intend to come back and go to events. We intend to go to festivals. Um, which is, is brilliant, like that's wonderful news um, for us that people still remember how wonderful it is and they are confident and comfortable to come back to them. But um, the intention is different to the reality of actually then purchasing the ticket or making the commitment, whether it's a free ticket, whether it's your community event. We also produce Newtown Festival um, in Sydney, which is a very large community run event. It's a, it's a donation only. Um, that hasn't gone ahead now. We're, that was my last show, actually, November 2019. Um, but again, the confidence of people coming along to a free... It is a free event, but we really need that fundraising. Do they want to be out in a big crowd when they're seeing so many other things around them? Even if it's not happening in their specific state or region, there is still that knock-on effect. Yeah. And um, the last point is just the ecosystem is just to, um, which I've started to talk about a little bit with the internationals coming in um, from a music festival perspective, but just a note about how this ecosystem kind of works. When I say an ecosystem with the festivals, um, often we've got crew who work at music festivals, but then their backup is doing something like this at a corporate event or, you know, doing, doing sound tech for some other type of event. Those events have all sort of moved on. Um, the hospitality industry that would normally fill the bars and fill the, um, the food trucks with staff, those guys always ha also had a dip last year. It's kind of just a whole ecosystem um, picture that is, is tenuously balanced and it's, um, it's currently just a little bit um, tricky with filling, fulfilling those needs um, of the music and festival industry. Um, the other point that I just wanted to make about an ecosystem perspective as well is skills shortage. People have been talking about this a little bit um, in different industries. We've, we're just the same. So there's a bit of a skill shortage, shortage happening with security guards. I don't know if anyone's come across this with their own venues, but there's a lot of security guards getting well paid for hotel quarantine, about 40% more than a crowd control security guard. You know, it'll be one of those problems that if it's great with summer events and we've got lots of things happening, which is really great for our industry, we might have this converse problem where we haven't got enough guards, where we haven't got enough hospitality staff to fill the bars, where we potentially have an issue with first aid, medical supply, um, event staff. So a lot of the doctors, nurses and paramedics would, that would normally fill an event, first aid, medical supply, are in vaccination centres, they're in testing centres. So it's just a, um, another point. We're getting past it. This is the last of the negative screens, I promise. <laughs> Priorities. So this is the kind of, uh, just to let you know where, what we're doing in terms of advocacy. So um, we think that the number one priority for us, for our members and for the industry is some type of insurance solution. So we have called it a business interruption fund. We're not fussed on semantics, whatever, whatever, whatever you want to call it is fine, but as long as we could get some type of um, assurance that if we have to shut down, if there's a blues fest, we don't have to look at that 70% cost and say goodbye to it. Yeah. That's correct. So um, just as COVID hit, there, there was all, there's always and there is still ticket cancellation insurance. That is a policy that exists for 
all types of um, ticketed events. That's the policy that you would normally get. Some people, and in fact a lot of um, people, a lot of promoters, a lot of events didn't get the add-on tagline that basically just says communicable disease or pandemic insurance because no one thought that it would be necessary, but now you can't get it even if you wanted it. So at the moment, you can't insure for any COVID-related lockdown. And that is the one point pointing to business confidence. Um, oh, did you want to jump in about that? I thought you were opening up the mic. <laughs> no? No. Um, so yeah, so business cancellation in, um, uh, sorry, business event cancellation. Fund. Event cancellation. Um, event cancellation fund. Something we don't mind what it's called. There was a screen um, solution. So there's a screen industry solution. Fifty million dollars the federal government provided in um, a temporary interruption fund. Um, WA and Tasmania both have an event interruption fund type um, situation. Both are not really fit for purpose. <laughs> oh, a cat. <laughs> Work from home. <laughs> a bit of light relief. A bit of light relief. Um, yeah, insurance. I, I thought that it was just hilarious what I was talking about. Um, <laughs> but there is no solution. Uh, basically, half of Europe now have a business interruption fund or cancellation fund for events and festivals. Um, the UK are in negotiations for one at the moment. We've provided several different options to several different versions of all of the levels of government that we try to get something like this through. But at, at, as yet, we haven't been able to get something on the East Coast, which is really where um, most of the activity happens that then informs the rest of the country. So that's our number one priority. We keep talking about it. Um, restrictions, so they do limit profitability at the moment. Um, we do recognise that, um, that that's, that's tricky with the public health messaging, but um, the restrictions on gatherings, on being able to dance, on being able to move um, is, has been an issue that we were feeling like they were maybe lifting a little bit um, recently and then Melbourne. Uh, um, uh, the essential worker status, this is the, an issue for just getting artists and crew across state lines when there's been a lockdown. So we have a member who had some shows in Perth um, that, and then when they went into lockdown, those shows were also supposed to go to Darwin, but because the artist was already in Perth, they couldn't do the Darwin shows. So that's just an example of getting them across the state lines. Um, as I mentioned, the skills shortage is another priority. Um, so we're working with ASIAL who um, are operate in the security space to try and work out how we can solve those problems um, and with the event medical, etc. And then rebooting right, which is where we get positive and start talking about some good stuff. And I hope that you're n sort of now back online, Francesca, because um, this is where you sort of step in. But just to explain um, kind of our philosophy about rebooting, right? Um, so as a Wiradjuri woman, First Nations First is a real priority for myself and also for our board. Um, and we just want to make sure that whatever um, considerations we're putting forward going going into the future, it's that we're always considering First Nations peoples, um, land council communication, um, welcome and acknowledgement of countries on um, festival sites, um, employment opportunities uh, and artist opportunities on lineups is, um, is a real priority for the AFA. Equality always, so this is equality in its truest sense. Again, gender parity across lineups, um, availability for you know women to be in um, women to be in really top positions in festivals, um, and um, and then also accessibility of festivals, um, making sure that venues are accessible, making sure that anything that we do sort of online gets. Um, gets kept from, from the COVID days of doing online um, parts of your festival, making sure that there's kind of an online capability if that's within your remit for those that can't attend festivals, for those that have any kind of sens sensory um, issues and, and can't be in crowds. Um, so thinking about those kinds of things. And then sustainability for the future. So this is, again, a global sense of the word sustainability, so of environmental sustainability, but also sustainability of the industry. Um, and. Yeah, I feel like I've been talking a lot. I think, oh, yeah. I think by and large, um, with the topic of rebooting right, we have discussed this on a number of occasions, that it does provide a sense of optimism um, that while, you know, uh, it is very challenging for festivals at the moment as a whole, um, industry, music, arts, community, um, it is a great opportunity to, when they come back, bring them back in, in a positive way and do all the things that a lot of us, as we've moved into festivals, I started when I was 20, so many things were already in place and you inherently, you know, as festivals turn over, it's like, well, same as last year, this is how we did it, 
this is how we've always done it. There's obviously a huge amount of benefit in that, but there is also a benefit in being able to look at something with fresh eyes and go, okay, we are starting a little bit from scratch again due to the capacities which are challenging, it also provides the opportunity to start again and, and build up from the ground upwards in, in a way that we're all really excited about and everybody has the opportunity to contribute to. So in terms of rebooting right, I, I do see that as quite a large opportunity. Yeah. And you guys at Groove in the Mood do some amazing things with um, with staffing your events and with engaging local community. You were talking about, I'm putting you on the spot. Um, <laughs> That's okay. So we, we are very youth driven. Yeah. Um, and youth do often get left out of um, the equation uh, when it comes to events. They often don't always have the best reputation. Um, just like music festivals, actually. So for us, um, youth are the next generation. We love them. Uh, our company background is a lot of us. I started out as a school teacher, actually. Um, so did one of our promoters. And um, we, we think investing in youth is really, really important. So for everything we do and why Groove of the Mood did start was to provide a cultural opportunity for youth in a regional area. They didn't have to travel to the city. They had something come to their own backyard. It was a safe environment. Um, it was actually run by a local company and the TAFE Music Industry Skills Group. So we threw it over to an educational institute to create the event for us and with us. Um, and that's something that we still do in every single region around Australia. And that's what underpins the show. We have a show for youth that is largely run by youth. Um, so we see youth as well, they are the future, they're the next generation, and why wouldn't you want to engage them in a really positive way um, and give them kudos for all the things that they can contribute um, to each of our communities? So when we look at sustainability, as Julia said, it's the greening, it's most certainly making sure that we are looking after our communities, that we can come back each time, but it's also making sure that there are continually patrons coming through. We are a licensed all ages, but we also give opportunities to people People who are wanting to work in the event space. Um, it means they might get internships, they get work experience, and it keeps our event fresh and people hopefully engaged. Amazing. So, Francesca, do we have you? Are you, you do. Oh, I'm good. not sure. Can you hear me? Amazing. Much better. You got two thumbs up. Excellent. So, should we handball? Yeah, sure. We were going to be speaking um, much more together, but uh, as a result of sound issues and me being in semi-lockdown in Victoria, I um, am calling you from Boomerang Territory and the giveaway of Victorian is a cat or a child coming in on the Zoom meeting. So I was just going to talk about there's a blurring between public and private events much more than ever and that collaboration is key. So as you've heard from Julia and Cash, you know, councils can permit, produce and also partner with festivals and therefore are the key to a festival's success. And if you approach a private festival organiser as a client or a partner, and provide a concierge approach to facilitation, you'll have the opportunity to build an event that brings great reward to the whole community. You're already working from a solutions-driven approach, being from a tourism and economic development perspective. And it's devastating when all your hard work is undermined by a risk officer, or worse, a mayor who decides to respond to a disgruntled community member and speaks negatively about an incoming event. So it's important to work together from the outset. One group I uh, led as a council officer was an internal meeting that was hugely productive. It was bringing together senior arts and culture, economic development, strategic planning, transport and parking, waste, capital works, communications, and sometimes even corporate services when councillors were involved. And as a result, our events were able to mitigate against obvious impact, such as a tree planted in the middle of a well-used concert area, or footpaths, but 
dug up in the middle of a festival area during a festival, or the film or the finding of cars at a Christmas concert that was designed to attract kids and old people. It really was never my favourite when everyone came back to their cars and there were parking fines everywhere. But we were able to leverage events to consult stakeholders on major changes to infrastructure, um, to land use. We were commissioning artworks to paint um, roads when we were trialling shared traffic zones. And it's really about working collaboratively so that you can highlight the advantages of working with an event to extend Council's aims and objectives. The benefits go both ways. And I think if you constantly remind everyone how festivals and events can meet their objectives, I found really positive um, strategic planning. Externally, if you're working on an enormous event, it's great to bring emergency services, trader associations, transport companies, even the EPA to make sure that your festival is getting the best support they can. It's really advantageous to let the RTA know because sometimes they decide on some roadworks that could be your evacuation route which is uh, something that happens. Um, on a local impact, you've heard from Kat how Groove in the Moo actually supports the local youth. And that's something that is not to be underestimated and something councils find really advantageous to draw on companies who link with young people in a way they like to be linked to. So I also find that if you approach music festivals and create yourselves as a resource that they can lean on so that you can partner with them on the difficult challenges. So things like um, health and safety, particularly in a fast changing COVID environment, I think you'll find that if you are becoming their guide, you can have a really cohesive festival in the end. Um, highlighting what your council's pillars, goals or KPIs are enables them to complement council's objectives and also helps them design proposals that are actually providing your community with support. And that's something that unless you do it, um, it's not as obvious for people working outside local government areas. Um, I think overlooked I've started to work with the state government um, in a tourism area and the companies that are benefiting from councils often don't know they're part of the tourism industry and that's petrol stations, hamburger shops, chemists. I think that they all get an enormous boost. I certainly have had to go out and look for camping you know, equipment mid-camp. Um, another thing is brand is being augmented by festivals. So the Port Ferry Folk Festival has helped Port Ferry become what it is. The Golden Plains Folk um, Festival, I certainly didn't know where Golden Plains was beforehand. And amenity is also something that is increasing with councils, where improved camping facilities, signage, public facilities, um, transport to festivals, you can ensure that there are buses coming out of train stations or even provide small bus routes back to town so that people can do shopping in town while they're at festivals. There's a myriad of opportunities that you might like to explore. Can the local pub sell showers to a three-day festival? Seriously, I was in need of a shower after going to a festival for three days. Can local community groups run sausage siddles or smoothie stands to raise funds? Is there a local winery, brewery or cheesemonger who could create a unique bar or service during a festival? And we know that operators and ticket buyers often ask for things. So ask your local festival provider, what do people need and what? Maybe your local organisation. Uh, we talked about impact measurement before. Maybe you'd like to come together to set some data sets and speak with Julia at AFA 
and Elizabeth Robinson at LG New South Wales about some software so that you're all comparing apples for apples and be able to advocate for festivals, but also plan for them and then communicate with organisations such as your public transport companies so they too can benefit from such an exercise and you can also get the police on side and maybe reduce um, driving to and from festivals. I think essentially if you give festivals the love, they will give you the love back. And one thing during this COVID environment I'd like to highlight is that festivals can be your greatest stakeholder. And maybe give them a call or email them or just reach out to demonstrate how you understand that they're doing a tough. Maybe let them know that you're looking forward to supporting their return and hope that um, you can set up a meeting soon to help plan for a safe and prosperous return to your area. Now, I've had a terrible echo throughout this whole thing. So I'm You've had a terrible echo. Sense. Is that what you said? A terrible <laughs> echo? Yes. Oh, sorry. It was okay for us. I could hear. Okay. I mean, it was great. I mean, it was fabulous, not just okay. It was excellent. <laughs> um, I didn't switch the screen over, but I think you've touched on those points. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I think we were hoping people might like to ask us some questions. Yeah. Does anyone want to ask us some questions? <laughs> Otherwise, of course, we know we're very, we were very mindful that you haven't eaten lunch yet. So given we drove up from Newcastle, where, yes. Just, just a comment in terms of, uh, <coughs> I, I guess, local government. I'm an elected councillor, mm -hmm. and I, I, although I'm just outside the demographic, um, I'm actually a supporter of new bars and, and new music, and it would be good, it would be good if you uh, came and talked to us, if you sought us out and came and talked to us. The AFA? Uh, everyone who's wanting to put stuff on, staff who are wanting to support you. It would be good if you came and talked to us. Okay. Yeah. I might just. I might just. Yeah. Add, just to add to that comment, um, for us, council, we see local council as a connector and a networker. So whenever we are putting on a show in a region, whether it's one we've been to many times before, most of our networks for youth groups and community groups do actually come from council. Um, the youth workers there particularly are brilliant and very valuable. And don't, I guess what I'm saying is that as council, don't underestimate how important council as a connector for local promoters are. Because for us, it's a great point of contact to find out who is who in town. Um, things do change quickly. We tend to pride ourselves on going to a town and engaging with it for a long period of time, not just blow in, blow out. Um, but we don't always have a full team on the ground. We might have two or three people on the ground. They might be an event manager. They might not work in the youth space. So for us, going to council to find out who does is, is amazing. And having a really enthusiastic councillor, mayor or group of people that work there can actually make or break a festival. Um, and there's nothing that we love more than when you know the mayor of Townsville, Jenny Hill, loves to come to Groove in the Moo and wants to stand side of stage to watch Peaches. And she can see that the whole group of kids from the Townsville Youth Network welcomed her as she walked in the gate because we employ them to work on doing wristbanding. So that, that definitely is a model that can work and, and should work, I think. And another thing I'd like to add, sorry. <laughs> I didn't know where um, you were coming from. <laughs> yes, yeah, As an interested councillor, you could even perhaps look at sharing infrastructure costs so that maybe an all ages gig or an alcohol free gig could be held using the same facilities after the event and then both the festival organiser and the council benefit and you could even speak to festival organisers about perhaps featuring one act or getting young people to be featured on the program of the other festival. Yeah, and that's a that's a great solve as well for if you were attack, if you're trying to tackle that problem of um, of being able to identify who was on your um, community site at that time. So if you normally have a free flowing um, festival or a community event, you could have a fenced event if you worked on a shared infrastructure model with a with a festival that comes to town and puts up a 
puts up a festival site, you could you could see how that might work in, in negotiation to keep their fence line and to, to use that controlled environment to help solve your COVID-related um, issues. Did you have a question? Yeah. yeah just following on from the previous question, we often have festivals in the external in the area we don't know anything about. Um, as you're saying, come and talk to us at council. But I'm, I'm wondering, is it too hard sometimes to talk to council? Is it about the planning system? Is there barriers? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, look, absolutely, the planning department can make or break an event. It doesn't matter how wonderful, welcoming and accommodating um, the event officers or the mayor or the councillors are. Um, there are just some realities of how planning laws get applied from council to council. Um, and to answer your question, I think that for us personally, we always go to council. Yes, it can be very hard. I work with nine different councils around Australia. All good relationships, all took varying amounts of time to get there. Um, but for a new promoter coming in or people that don't know, council can seem very overwhelming. It also can be very hard. You might get bounced between department to department. Um, they might call a wrong department in the first instance who then refer to them, them to someone who doesn't actually know what they're talking about. Then they get told they have to do a development application, which are also extremely challenging. Um, and if a council is applying the letter of the law of that DA to an event, in a lot of instances, that event's ne never going to cross the line. The amount of money that festival organisers have to output to meet the requirements of a DA are very large. In the COVID environment, um, the amount of money that you will even get from your festival, because you can only have such a low number of people, is completely negated by the time you pay for all your DA costs. Um, so, you know, that the, the councils that I find that we work with who are really successful in that space understand the planning, but they know how to apply it to make it work um, for everybody. So the community does come first. They are listening to their constituents, but they're also make the process easy and workable for the promoter. And that sort of talks and that's to where that the concierge comes oh, in. Sorry. sorry, that's something we're implanting in Victoria where a concierge is set up from the front to help festival organisers go through that process. That's what you're doing? Right. Yes. Where were you from again? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, great. great. Probably time for one more question. Or none, because or none. there needs, seems to be none. Okay. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Julia, Catherine and Francesca there in Melbourne. Um, I think at one stage you sort of apologised saying it's all about, you know, sorry about the nuts and bolts. Um, but what I found was actually really useful was learning about those nuts oh, and bolts. So I think the difference is that council does have its DA processes and things. But what I got from your conversations today was a much better understanding of it from the business perspective. And maybe that's now on us to take that information back to various stakeholders and to be continued to be informed about that there is a business behind it, that there are people behind those businesses, and, and having that understanding of the challenges that you face may make it easier in terms of the normal sort of preoccupation of DAs and what rubbish bins go where and what roads get closed. Yeah, that's our first point there, yeah. is in place of certainty, we need flexibility and adaptability, yeah. Yeah. which so is real. I think at the that, moment. that came out very clearly from, oh, good. from your presentation, so I'd like everyone to thank the three of them. Thank Thanks. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Amazing. Oh, lovely. Oh, thanks, guys. Very sweet. Thank you. We'll send yours down the line, Francesca. Yeah. I'll bring, I'll bring it with me when I go back to Melbourne tomorrow. Oh, so my housekeeping. Oh, I don't have my housekeeping here. Um, I guess you're just going to lunch. There's the housekeeping taken care of. Food. Presume it's in the same place as all the other food. <laughs> Thanks a lot.